Good morning, everybody. Thanks for being here today. We'll go ahead and get started and let folks uh, filter in, grab some uh, coffee or breakfast over in the corner there. Uh, I'm Sam Austin. I'm the director of the Evidence-Based Health Policy Project. And thanks again for attending today's briefing titled Feeling the Squeeze, Prescription Drug Pricing Trends and State Policy Options. Appreciate all of you joining us. We have a great panel here today. Uh, we'll provide several uh, great perspectives on this issue. Before we get started, I'd like to briefly introduce the Evidence-Based Health Policy Project. The goal of the project is to connect research and expertise at the university and elsewhere into the health policy making process here at the Capitol and support evidence-informed decision making broadly. And that goal is driven by the idea that ongoing dialogue and the development of trust between policymakers and academic uh, researchers can enhance and elevate the work of both. We work to serve as a resource at the Capitol and a resource on campus through the convening of uh, timely, nonpartisan, and high-quality briefings such as this one, and facilitate interaction uh, between the university and the legislature in many forms. This project is a unique partnership of the University of Wisconsin-Madison uh, Population Health Institute, where I'm housed, the Follett School of Public Affairs at UW-Madison, and the Wisconsin Legislative Council. I'd like to recognize Hillary Shagger from the Follett School and Steve McCarthy from the Ledge Council, who are project partners and play a key role in making this project successful. Thanks also to Rochelle Andre, second year student at La Follette School, who's the project assistant uh, this year. Uh, plays a vital role in making this project run smoothly and appreciate her work. Uh, she's graduating uh, from La Follette in May and we'll miss her, we'll miss her greatly. Uh, this project is made possible by the support of our funders, which include the Wisconsin Partnership Program at the UW School of Medicine and Public Health, the Community Academic Partnership at the Institute for Clinical and Translational Research, also known as ICTER CAP at UW Madison, and the UW Madison Chancellor's Office. We appreciate their support and thank them for enabling us to convene venues such as this one. We develop these events with the input of our Legislative Advisory Board, a bipartisan group of legislators representing a range of perspectives on health issues. Our current board membership includes Representatives Deb Colsty, who is our moderator today, as well as Representatives Joe Sanfilippo, Daniel Reamer, Jesse Rodriguez, Joan Balweg, and Paul Tittle, and Senators Devin Lemihue, Mark Miller, and Leah Vukmir. We truly appreciate the engagement of those offices uh, and of the legislators who are able to be here today. The folders are received upon entering have several documents, today's agenda, biographies, biographies for each of our speakers, and a list of further resources on this topic, including several Wisconsin-specific resources. It also includes overviews of the EBHPP and the UW Population Health, uh, Population Health Institute, and a summary of the October 2016 report of the National Academy for State Health Policy's Pharmacy Cost Work Group uh, called Call to Action. Um, we'll learn more about that today from uh, Eileen Mallow. Finally, you'll see a two-sided evaluation sheet. We hope you take a minute to fill out. We aim to be as responsive as possible uh, to the needs of our audience, uh, and we can't do that without your feedback. As we met with legislators this session uh, to discuss EBHPP and their health policy interests, uh, prescription drug costs have come up time and again uh, as an issue affecting the pocketbooks of their constituents and the pocketbooks of, the, of state government. Advances and developments in drug treatments bring the potential for improved treatment and potential cures to serious diseases. However, the rising costs of these drugs raising, raises questions of access and sustainability. Media headlines have brought an entire new and ever-changing pharmaceutical lexicon to the health policy discourse, from Eliquis to Embril, Savaldi to Spinraza. Today's panel aims to shed light on the process of prescription drug pricing, ongoing activities here in Wisconsin, and possible uh, options for state policymakers moving forward. We'll hear from Kevin Look from the UW Pharmacy School with an overview of this issue to set the table for the panel, Joe Cesars from UW Health Pharmacy Services, a section on specialty drugs, Rachel Kearns Henry from the Department of Health Services uh, to talk about efforts by the state to monitor and control drug spending in the Medicaid program, and Eileen Mallow from the Department of Employee Trust Funds on her involvement and work with the NASHP Pharmacy Cost work, work Group. We hope that these perspectives will give a well-rounded look at this issue for everyone in attendance. Today's moderator is Representative Deborah Colsty of Janesville from the state's 44th Assembly District. She was first elected to the Assembly in 2012 after previously serving for nine years on the Janesville School Board and has direct experience with healthcare delivery through her career as a medical technologist. She is currently the ranking minority member on the Assembly Health Committee, has served on the Speaker's Task Force on Mental Health in 2013 and the Task Force on Alzheimer's and Dementia in 2015. And as previously mentioned, and in what I can only assume is her proudest achievement as a legislator, she is a member of the EBHPP <laughs> Legislative <laughs> Advisory Board. 
Uh, so Representative Mikulski, thank you for moderating this event. Uh, we appreciate it and take it away. Actually, you stole my line. <laughs> my real claim to fame is that I do attend these meetings because I get a wealth of information that I would never be able to research myself and come to any kind of conclusion. So I really do appreciate this group. Um, I, can, I think we can assess from the large number of people that are here and registered that this is a very important topic. Um, we all know about myelin and the EpiPens or Martin Scarelli, but recently we have had others like Marathon Pharmacy that increased the price of a long-standing drug from $1,600 to $54,000. This kind of pricing affects us personally and our insurance. It is also having a very direct effect on our Medicaid budget. I know we're all interested in hearing if there is any way we can get some glimpse of how we can handle these pricing structures in our personal and statewide budgets. So first, we have our first speaker is Kevin Look, an assistant professor at the University of Wisconsin School of Pharmacy. His research focuses on prescription drug insurance coverage and the impact of cost containment policies on the cost, access, and quality of medication use. Dr. Licht received his Doctor of Pharmacy and his Ph.D. in Social and Administrative Sciences at the University of Wisconsin-Madison with a focus on economic and, policy po and public policy analysis. He is also a practicing community pharmacist. But most importantly, he is soon to be a first-time father. So. so you're saying if I have to run out of the room, there's a really good reason. It's not because of the questions. And I'm going with him. <laughs> Well, thank you for uh, joining us this morning and um, for allowing me the opportunity to talk with you this morning. I have uh, what is the unfortunate uh, task of trying to lay the groundwork for this discussion by trying to cover everything about pricing on prescription drugs in about 20 to 25 minutes. So uh, I'm going to do my best to do that. So I'm going to start off by describing uh, an overview of the issue along with some of the trends that we're seeing in both healthcare generally as well as with prescription drugs specifically. And then I'm going to be talking about what are some of the factors that go into determining the price of a prescription drug. And then I'll be pointing out some of the concerns or controversies that have been raised recently over drug prices. And then my fellow panelists today will be building off of this material to point out uh, issues specific to specialty medications, efforts to control costs in the Medicaid program, and then ways that state uh, legislatures can actually uh, potentially impact some of this through policy efforts. So first I wanted to pro provide a, a brief description of how spending on healthcare in general has changed over time. And healthcare expenditures is a commonly see used term that you might see and refers to how much money is being spent on healthcare. And expenditures are a function of two things, quantity and price. So the quantity of care increases as the demand for healthcare services increases. And really one of the driving factors behind this in the US right now is the aging of the US population. We're seeing a much greater need for the use of prescription drugs. Prices increase for a variety of reasons. One is the use of newer, more expensive medical technologies or prescription drugs that are being released. And then there's also things like general inflation that come into play as well. Increased prices and in services in healthcare have led to rapid increases in healthcare expenditures. So um, I'm not sure my uh, PowerPoint skills are entirely up to par anymore. But you can see that spending on healthcare in general has increased greatly in the U.S. over the past several decades. So in 1960, the U.S. spent about 5% of its money on health care, which is about $150 per person. Today that number is closer to 18% or around $11,000. And it's expected that this is going to continue to increase over time. And of course, this is money that had previously been spent in other areas of the economy, such as education or transportation. I mentioned one of the reasons that prices increase uh, is just sort of naturally due to inflation. But the rising costs of health care have outpaced general inflation in nearly every year over the past decade. And uh, to put this another way, Americans are spending a larger proportion of their income on health care than other basic necessities such as food and clothing. The U.S. spends a lot more money on health care than any other country in the world. And due to the unique nature of our healthcare system, there are a lot of reasons for why this can occur. But one of the big contributing factors to these increases right now is rises in the cost of prescription drugs. Before I start talking about drugs specifically, there are a couple of important terms that I wanted to point out that are going to be used throughout today's discussions. Uh, so we're focusing today on prescription drugs. So these are things where you need to obtain a valid prescription 
from an authorized prescriber, so this could be something like a physician or a nurse practitioner or a physician assistant. And then the, the prescription needs to be filled and dispensed by a pharmacy or administered by a healthcare facility such as a hospital or a clinic. And prescription drugs fall into one of two categories. The first one shown accounts for about 15% of, of drugs dispensed each year, and these are for brand name drugs. And some other names you might hear to refer to these things are things like single source or patent protected drugs. These drugs are identified via intensive research and development efforts and are protected by patents that give companies the exclusive monopoly rights to produce and sell that drug in the United States. And so these drugs have to go through rigorous uh, clinical trials to demonstrate their safety and efficacy in humans. And they're also heavily marketed and advertised by manufacturers. <coughs> Generic drugs are the second category and they make up about 85% of drugs that are dispensed each year. And some other names you might hear are multi-source or off-patent drugs. And the reason some of these names are used is that once a brand name drug's patent protection expires, other companies are allowed to seek approval to produce the same exact drug. And since there are multiple companies producing the same drug, typically the market is a lot more competitive and prices are often much lower than for brand name drugs. But there may be some cases or some factors where this isn't necessarily the case. For example, if there's only one producer of a generic drug, which would then give that manufacturer more market power and more control over pricing, which I'll give some examples of that a little later on. Since brand name manufacturers have a monopoly on the production and sale of the drug, and the U.S. is a free market economy where we don't have price controls on uh, prescription drugs, manufacturers are free to set the prices at what they feel is appropriate. So what we've been seeing are annual increases in brand name drug prices, which are shown here, that have exceeded not only what we're seeing in general inflation, but it's also growing a lot faster than other types of health care are growing as well, uh, in addition. So these increases are not restricted just to brand name drugs. We're also seeing rapid increases in the prices of generic drugs as well. An important factor that's contributing to increasing prices seen for prescription drugs is the introduction of costly new specialty medications. And specialty drugs are much more difficult and expensive to produce than traditional medications. And they also typically require some sort of intensive clinical monitoring to ensure that these drugs are being used safely and effectively. It's also much more difficult to produce generic copies of these drugs. So there are some limitations on the cost savings that can be achieved once the patent protection expires. And Dr. Caesars, Caesars will be talking next to give you some more information about the unique characteristics and, uh, char and issues faced when dealing with specialty medications. But it's important to realize that not only are these drugs significantly more expensive than other medications, but they're also growing in price at a much faster rate. And you can see here that the U.S. Uh, pays a lot more for drugs, for specialty drugs, than other countries. So here I have an example of Humira, which is a drug used to treat rheumatoid arthritis and psoriasis and a variety of other conditions. And the U.S. pays about 15% more for this drug than the next closest country in the world, which is Canada. And a competitor of Humira, Enbrel, which is used to treat the same conditions, is priced at about 35% higher than Canada. Here in Wisconsin, we're seeing similar uh, trends as the national picture on when it comes to prescription drugs. So I have here some actual and potential uh, projected expenditures for costs for the Senior Care Program, which is a uh, prescription drug assistance program for low-income Wisconsin residents who are 65 years of age or older. Later on, we'll also be hearing about how prescription drugs are impacting the Wisconsin Medicaid program as well. But as you can see, we're seeing large increases here in Wisconsin as well. So what are the factors that impact the price of a prescription drug? As the producer of a drug, the manufacturer determines the initial price of a medication, and they create what is known as a list price. Uh, one of the commonly used list prices is an AWP, or average wholesale price, that I have here. But basically, this is a price that is published and available in a database that contains current information on drug pricing and product information, and other companies and organizations are able to purchase and obtain this information. This price is intended to reflect the actual price of a drug and has been used for decades as the basis for all pricing and payment systems in the United States. And the reason these list prices are used is that they're really the only publicly available uh, ways to obtain market prices for prescription drugs. 
And manufacturers determine their prices based on a variety of factors, such as those shown here. So there's the cost of producing these medications, there's research and development costs, and then there's taxes and other fees as well as some level of profit as well. So I mentioned that these, these list prices are being used to determine the prices and payment for prescription drugs. But it's becoming increasingly apparent over the past couple of years that these list prices do not accurately reflect the true costs of these medications. And many states, including here in Wisconsin, have successfully brought lawsuits against pharmaceutical manufacturers for allegedly inflating their uh, list prices in order to increase reimbursement from uh, state Medicaid programs. And manufacturers have also come under criticism for allegedly including marketing and advertising costs in their research and development budgets as a way to hide how much is actually being spent on these activities. There we go. So um, analyses of financial records from major pharmaceutical firms have estimated that about half of manufacturer revenue is spent on marketing or is kept as profit by the company. And marketing can include things like detailing to physicians or other prescribers. So this is where a pharmaceutical representative would go to a, a prescriber's office and uh, raise awareness of new medications that are on the market in an effort to increase prescribing of these drugs. Marketing uh, can also include direct-to-consumer advertising. So these are the drug ads that you see in magazines and on TV and in newspapers that directly advertise drugs to consumers. And this practice is actually illegal in all countries in the world except for the United States and New Zealand. Pharmaceuticals have consistently ranked among the most profitable industries for decades, with some sources estimating that profit margins are actually closer to 25 to 30%. So in reality, only a relatively small proportion is spent on research and development costs. But further complicating this issue is the fact that most drug research is not solely funded by the drug industry. About 75% of drugs that are newly released that are classified as innovative new medications are actually funded by the National Institutes of Health, or the NIH. And the NIH receives most of its funding from taxpayer dollars, and they support drug research and development via grants, where much of the research is actually conducted at large universities, such as here at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Uh, much of the industry's research funding is also spent on acquiring drugs that were developed by smaller firms. And uh, there are also the development of what are known as Me Too drugs which are slight variations of existing drugs on the market that really offer very incremental benefits of, over what's already available. One final thing to note here is the large amount of spending in the other expenses category. So this can include things like large amounts that are spent on efforts to extend patent protection for profitable drugs or in efforts to delay generic entry for new drugs. Manufacturers also set aside sizable sums of money to cover uh, the costs of lawsuits and settlements. So, for example, it's been estimated that Merck has paid more than $8.5 billion in settlements uh, related to injuries, legal costs, and illegal marketing claims for the drug Vioxx. So, uh, manufacturers justify their pricing using several explanations. Uh, the first and the main rationale is the high cost of research and development for these new drugs, as well as the increase in complexity of developing and producing these newer specialty medications. These prices are also justified due to the potential for generating savings to the healthcare system, as in many cases it's actually cheaper to use a prescription drug than it would be to use other uh, treatments such as surgeries or other procedures. And manufacturers are also very strategic about uh, pricing, and they price their products based on the presence and pricing of other uh, competing products that are either already on the market or that are under development by other firms. So what else influences the prices paid for a prescription drug? And here you can see that my PowerPoint skills really did not work out too well. <laughs> so on the right side of the screen, you see the pathway from where a drug is produced until it ends up in the patient's hands for use. Manufacturers produce drugs and they sell them to wholesalers. And the wholesalers then distribute these medications to pharmacies or to healthcare facilities where they're then dispensed or administered to patients. And the organizations in each step of this pathway are involved in the buying and the selling of drugs. And of course, their prices do include some level of profit at each of those steps, although the profits are gonna vary considerably. But complicating the uh, matters in this situation is the role of payers, uh, which can include organizations that pay for healthcare in the public sector, such as Medicare or Medicaid, or organizations in the private sector, such as pharmacy benefit managers or PBMs. 
Payers administer drug benefits for health plans or employer groups, and they negotiate with manufacturers for discounts and rebates on prescription drugs. And they do so in exchange for more favorable placement on a drug formulary, which can in turn increase sales and market share. Payers also negotiate with pharmacies for uh, discounted payment amounts. But some PBMs have recently come under uh, intensive scrutiny for contributing to the rising costs of prescription drugs for engaging in several activities, uh, including due to a lack of transparency when it comes to the size of negotiated discounts and rebates with manufacturers, and for keeping these savings as profits instead of passing on the savings to their clients. And uh, if you just saw in the news within the last day or so, uh, Anthem, which is one of the larger health insurance companies in the country, and Express Scripts, one of the larger PBMs in the country, have been at war over uh, allegedly withholding some of those savings that have come from some of these rebates. I've included this picture here just to give you a sense of who's paying for prescription drugs and what can be impacted by state policy versus what would require broader health care reform at the federal level. So privately, Private insurance that's obtained through employers or individually purchased by someone through something like the, the Affordable Care Act marketplaces uh, account for the largest proportion of drugs that are purchased each year. And then Medicare accounts for about 30% of spending. And being a federal program, there's really not a, lot of, uh, not a big role for state policy to impact that program. But the Medicaid program, which is about 9 or 10% or so, uh, states do have a big role in impacting that. And then the final category, about 15% of spending is on patient out-of-pocket spending. And this can include things like insurance co-payments or drugs that are purchased without any insurance at all. And when a drug is purchased without any insurance at all, uh, the patients have to pay the full price of the medication because there is no insurance company negotiating for discounts or rebates on their behalf. Over time, though, we have seen shifts in this distribution where we're seeing fewer and fewer people covered by the employer-sponsored private insurance, and we're seeing more of a shift toward the, the public programs like Medicare and, in particular, Medicaid as well. <coughs> Shown here are some of the other factors that can influence prescription drug pricing. So this can include the size of the patient population. Uh, some of our panelists today will be discussing what are known as orphan drugs, which are drugs that are approved for use in a very small population of patients. And because there are so few patients with these conditions, the prices for these drugs are often considerably higher than average in order to recoup, recoup those drug and development loss, uh, costs. Prices can also rise due to factors like the patent and monopoly protection that I touched on earlier, and also due to consolidation within the drug industry as these larger firms have more market power and are able to have more of a say over the price of drugs. Some factors related to insurance coverage can also uh, impact drug prices. There's also been a lot of consolidation within the, the drug insurance industry, which again results in more market power for those companies. And there's also been some price increases uh, to make up for losses due to the discounts and rebates that are mandated by law through things like state Medicaid programs as well. And then we're also seeing, like I mentioned earlier, increased demand for prescription drugs as our population is getting older and there's more of a need for prescription drugs. So there are a lot of factors that go into ter determining the price of a prescription drug. And in 20 minutes, it would be impossible for me to cover all of the nuances of how prices for drugs are determined. Um, but recognize that our healthcare system is very complex and that pricing for prescription drugs is very uh, complicated and that there are a lot of factors and organizations that can impact the prices of prescription drugs. So the issue under discussion today is how to address some of the common concerns that have been expressed over the prices of prescription drugs. So you might be wondering, what are those concerns that have been expressed? <laughs> well, I happen to have some of the, the common ones here for you today. So probably the biggest one is the lack of pricing transparency uh, and how money is being spent by both manufacturers as well as pharmacy benefit managers. Launch prices for prescription drugs are also rapidly increasing, and we're seeing annual price increases of about 10% per year as being the new norm. This figure shows how the prices for uh, newly available agents on the market for, uh, to treat cancer over the past 40 years and how they've increased over time. And you would think that despite the growing number of available agents on the market, there might be some more competition and we might see lower prices. But in fact, we've seen the complete opposite of that. So as prescription drugs become more expensive, payers are forced to raise premiums to ensure there's adequate funds to pay for uh, claims for prescription drugs. But public payers, such as state governments, often face uncertain tax revenues each year and also have to balance the 
uh, spending on health care and the spending in other areas of the economy. We're also seeing some decreasing returns from new agents. For example, although the prices of many cancer drugs have increased over time, many of the newer agents are not associated with greater survival benefits when compared with older drugs. So the benefits of the drugs in, in many cases are not justified by the increased prices. Or at least that's what we're seeing in, in some of the literature. So as you've probably read about or seen in the news, prescription drug prices have generated increasingly heated controversy in recent years, and many large manufacturers have come under fire for engaging in business practices that, that contribute to inflated drug prices. So the two main areas of recent controversy are the rising introductory costs of drugs that are newly being introduced into the U.S. marketplace, and then we're also seeing rapid price increases for drugs that are already approved either here in the U.S. or in other countries. And I think it would be unfair of me if I did not preface my comments by saying that these are probably the more excessive uh, examples that I'm going to be discussing, but they're also the ones that are most talked about um, by our patients and by our citizens, and they are also are reflective of what's occurring more broadly in the uh, pharmaceutical marketplace. But again, some of these are probably going to be a little bit more excessive than you know the average case. So one of the cases uh, that started a lot of discussion around drug pricing was the introduction of a new class of drugs to treat hepatitis C. And Sovaldi was the first drug of this type to be released, and this can actually cure the disease. So it was it is a very innovative new medication. But the producer of the drug, Gilead Sciences, was heavily criticized for the high cost of these drugs, which was about $1,000 per pill when this drug was released into the marketplace. When this drug was released, the prices that were being paid in the U.S. were significantly higher than in other countries, which is consistent with some of those other examples that I showed you earlier. Over the past few years, we have seen other drugs of this type released, and as a result, prices are uh, going down somewhat. But it is unclear how much these prices have decreased uh, because the list prices that I said don't really accurately reflect the cost of these drugs have remained largely the same, but instead we're seeing larger and larger discounts and rebates being offered to insurance companies, but it's unclear how, how large those discounts really are. Another case that was much more recent uh, that the representative touched on was the case of Marathon Pharmaceuticals and the drug called Deflazacort. So this is a drug that had been available outside of the U.S. previously for decades. Um, I think the number that I had found was about 1,200, but you know, there's always some variability in that. So it was available for about $1,200 per year, but the drug re uh, Marathon received fast track approval to have this drug approved for use in the U.S., and they listed the price initially at $89,000, which is a 70 times or a 70 fold increase in the price of this drug. As a result, there was a lot of public outcry and outrage over the price of this drug, and Marathon decided to delay introduction of the drug into the U.S. marketplace as a result of these concerns. And as an update to the story, this past week it was just announced that Marathon had reached a deal to sell the drug to another company. When it comes to price increases, there probably hasn't been a case more prominent in the news than Turing Pharmaceuticals and Daraprim. Shortly after acquiring the rights to the drug Daraprim, Turing... Whoop, Turing raised the price from $13.50 a pill to $750 a pill, which was an increase of over 5,000%. And the CEO of Turing, uh, shown here, Martin Shkreli, was called to testify in Congress, and uh, when asked to justify these price increases, he chose to invoke his Fifth Amendment rights instead of answering the questions. Another case that was in the news this past fall was the pricing for EpiPen injectors which is a drug used to treat severe allergic reactions. And Mylan was accused of making so-called unjustified increases in the price of this life-saving drug. And their CEO was also called to testify in Congress. And here I have a, a graph showing how the price of EpiPens has increased over time, which have nearly quadrupled since 2010. And Mylan's CEO has claimed that the list prices don't accurately reflect the amount that they receive for the drug. So if I sound like a broken record, again, this is coming from the CEO of Mylan. And she has also acknowledged that parts of our healthcare system are broken and that there's a greater need for transparency on pricing. As an update on this issue, it was also announced this week that uh, a competitor of Mylan for the EpiPen Sanofi Pharmaceuticals was suing Mylan for allegedly running up the prices of these medications and then offering large rebates to payers, to state Medicaid programs, and to PBMs, but on the condition that they don't cover any other medications. 
and so there are some antitrust uh, lawsuits now being pursued in this area. As a final example, many of you are probably aware that Wisconsin is in the midst of an opioid epidemic, and there are a lot of efforts that have been going on at both the state and federal levels in order to try and address this important issue. And one vital component of many opioid treatment efforts is the use of naloxone. And this is a drug that reverses opioid overdoses long enough for emergency medical services to arrive and administer further treatment. And there have been laws passed here in Wisconsin to make naloxone more widely available, uh, including a statewide standing order where individuals can obtain the drug from pharmacies without a prescription. And there have also been efforts to make the drug available for use by law enforcement and local communities. So the manufacturer of uh, the naloxone auto-injector, Kaleo Pharmaceuticals, uh, has recently come under scrutiny for raising the prices of this drug from $690 to $4,500. And anecdotally, this is leading to a lot of problems for patients, hospitals, and other organizations around the state that are trying to obtain this drug to help combat the opioid epidemic. So as a result of these controversies that are appearing in the news and the concerns over the prices, uh, this has led to a lot of interest in the public in the creation of policies to help keep drug prices down. But despite this growing interest, as of now, there are still few policies at either the state or the national level to address this issue. Now, as you can see from this cover of drug topics from 1974, prescription drug spending has been an issue under discussion for over 40 years. So this isn't exactly uh, anything new. But this just reinforces how sensitive this issue is and how difficult it is to address. So overall, the U.S. healthcare system is seeing large increases in drug prices that are higher than what's being seen through things like general inflation, generally in healthcare, as well as compared to other countries. And Wisconsin is no different with large price increases being seen, or increases in drug spending being seen for both public and private payers. The lack of transparency in drug prices and the rebates between manufacturers and payers are some of the most cited concerns with prescription drugs, and we're seeing rapid price increases in both brand and generic drugs. And we're also seeing rapid growth in the introduction of expensive specialty medications that we'll hear more about from our next speaker. One thing I wanted to mention is that while there are important concerns about the prices of prescription drugs, there's also a recognition among the public that there needs to be some balance between containing the costs of prescription drugs and protecting uh, developing innovative new medications. But because of some of the factors that I discussed, especially the lack of transparency, it's become very difficult to accurately assess the costs and benefits of many of these medications. And it's also difficult to justify that some of these price increases are necessary for research and development when companies are taking older drugs and rapidly raising the prices when little or no research and development is being conducted. Finally, there is growing public support at both the national and state levels, but this is a very difficult issue to address both politically as well as practically. And my colleagues on the panel will be discussing some of the proposed ways that this might be accomplished. So thank you very much for your time. Well, I personally could ask about 500 questions on that topic alone. But our next presenter, I've heard at previous seminars, and um, I know he'll have more information and more questions. Our next speaker is Joe Cesars, the Director of Ambulatory <coughs> pardon me, Pharmacy Services at UW Health. He serves as the Director of UW Health Specialty Pharmacy Residency Training Program. He received his Doctor of Pharmacy and Master's of Science degrees in Health System Pharmacy Administrations from the UW School of Pharmacy and he has over 10 years of pharmacy experience in the inpatient and retail pharmacy se settings. Well, thank you for that introduction, Representative Colsby, and I'd just like to thank Kevin as well. He did a great job of providing a, a very good overview of a lot of the issues that we're seeing within drug pricing in, in the pharmacy world today. Um, and just to hit on a few other points, Sam mentioned a few medications, but I'm going to be talking about specialty medications as well as the marketplace that we have uh, within specialty and, and within pharmacy. And just to give you some examples of costs that we're talking about, so Kevin mentioned the hepatitis C drugs. Uh, these cost $30,000 per month to treat a patient with. Um, so we're talking about giving a patient basically a new car every month to help treat their condition. Um, there's a lot of medications that have come out. Sam mentioned Spinraza. Is a good example. That's one that we're battling with right now at UW Health. It costs $125,000 per dose to treat a patient and about $750,000 per year. Um, so looking at those high price tag medications, it's definitely an important 
important thing that we have to battle as a health system and as a pharmacy. Um, so hopefully I can shed some light on that. Um, but really my goal is to provide a little bit of overview about specialty pharmacy and what it is. It can be a little bit of a mystifying topic. Um, and each of these slides, similar to Kevin's, we could probably spend 10 to 15 minutes on. So I'm going to do my best to, to be succinct and share some of the high-level considerations. And we can definitely answer any questions that you have with, with the question and answer section. So my three goals are to talk about what is a specialty pharmacy product, some common characteristics of what defines these products. And then also looking at the business side of it, the brick and mortar pharmacy, what differentiates a specialty pharmacy from a traditional pharmacy. And then as a result of that, what are some of the implications that we have in Wisconsin and some thoughts about what we could do. So as Kevin mentioned, there's two buckets to consider. One is the cheap to steep. So these are the generic products that have been on the market for a long time, in some cases decades. Uh, they're bought up by a manufacturer or a manufacturer decides to, pr to increase the price unpredictably. So as a health system, we don't necessarily know when this is going to happen. It happens and then we have to try to battle and figure out how are we going to treat patients with these conditions and make sure that not only are we treating patients, but we're able to receive reimbursement for these products. I'm going to focus my presentation on the specialty side. So a specialty is a unique class of medications. It's a unique marketplace. Um, so these are those high initial sticker price products. They come out to the market um, and they're extremely expensive right off the bat. Um, and they also take predictable price increases over time. So like Kevin referenced, the price increases for these products and the inflation on these products oftentimes is double or triple what general inflation is. So there's other considerations that I'll be talking about at the end with regard to that. When you look at why it's important to talk about the specialty marketplace, this is just a graph that demonstrates over the past five years and looking to five years from now, what does the marketplace revenue look like for traditional drugs versus specialty drugs? So you can see about five years ago, specialty products made up 17% of the marketplace. Today they're around 28%, and in 2021 they're predicted to be about 42%, so almost half of the entire uh, pharmaceutical marketplace. So... I want to provide some building blocks for the discussion today. So first we're going to talk about what is a specialty pharmacy product. So unfortunately part of the challenge with this is that there's not a clear definition for what is a specialty pharmacy product and it varies across different stakeholders and it also changes over time. So products have historically been launched as non-specialty that have become specialty. So manufacturers typically set the specialty tag on a product when they launch it. However, due to cost, a payer could also decide that it's going to be in their specialty formulary and that's going to be defined as specialty through that mechanism. These products can be take-home, so it could be a prescription that you pick up at a pharmacy and administer in the home setting. They could also be clinic-administered medications, so thinking about high-cost oncology infusions or high-cost infusions used to treat um, inflammatory conditions. And then oftentimes there's a subset of disease states that we consider specialty disease states. So um, I'll provide a list of those, but sometimes just by virtue of being in that disease state, a, a product may be considered specialty. So looking at some common characteristics of specialty products, the most prominent one and probably why we're here today is the high cost of these products. Um, so these products, like I mentioned, come out with a high price tag, and this is the primary driver of what is going to consider something specialty. So if something has a specialty tag associated with it, it's by virtue likely going to be a very high cost product. These medications are often have complex treatment regimens, so it may be something where there's an initial loading phase or an initial phase for a patient where they inject something every two weeks for a few months and then there's a maintenance phase thereafter, so it's a little bit trickier and requires a little bit more hands-on from a pharmacist or care provider perspective. It may require special handling, storage, or delivery. Um, so a lot of these products are refrigerated products. Um, so when we think about the distribution and wholesale side of it, there's unique considerations with that as well as when patients are handling the products. Um, like Kevin referenced, a lot of these are derived through biotechnology or more advanced technology than historical small molecule uh, medications that we're used to seeing in the marketplace. So there's new technology and innovation associated with creating these products. They can be injectable, infusible, or oral. Historically, they've been mostly injectable and infusible products. However, more recently, we've seen a lot more oral products within the specialty marketplace come out. Hepatitis C is a good example. The HIV products, most of those are oral products as well, uh, is a good example. But So we're starting to see a lot more oral formulations for specialty products. Historically, these have also been used to treat very small percentages of the population. So think 0.02% of the population used to treat with a specialty product. 
Once again, we've seen over the past few years that that's increased as well. So some of these products are launching into more chronic disease state markets like cholesterol. We've seen some specialty products, so a much larger patient population that would be treated with those products. And then another um, key point is a lot of these products have limited or exclusive product availability and distribution. So not every pharmacy has the capability of accessing the product, and not every pharmacy has the capability of receiving reimbursement or is in a payer network that would receive reimbursement for that product. So none of these are exclusive. Um, but not all of these have to be in place for a product to be considered specialty pharmacy. Um, and as you'll see as we talk through it, the high cost is probably the biggest driver and what drives a lot of the implications for how we manage these patients and these drugs. And then the product distribution and availability also impacts Wisconsin, Wisconsin pharmacies and patients. So just to hit on this distribution model a little bit, so I'm going to start off on the far right-hand side of the slide looking at the traditional drug distribution model. So historically in the marketplace, um, a manufacturer launches a product. It's available to any wholesaler that contracts with the manufacturer, and then any pharmacy that contracts with that wholesaler has historically had access to that product. So this is the, the distribution model that we've historically been used to in the pharmacy setting. And the middle section is a little bit more of a limited um, distribution model. So it's a specialty contract distribution model. So in this setting, the wholesaler is still involved. So the manufacturer will contract with a wholesaler. Um, but it's usually one or a few specialty wholesalers. So not every wholesaler is going to have access to this product. And then you as a pharmacy would have to be contracted with that specialty wholesaler in order to access that product. And then on the far left, it shows the limited drug distribution model. So this one probably has the most implications for pharmacies in Wisconsin, but in this type of model, a manufacturer could launch a specialty product, and usually before the launch, they contract with one or a few specialty pharmacies in the nation um, that can dispense this product alone. Um, so there are some products out there where there's only one pharmacy in the nation that can provide this product to patients. So if you require the product, you have to use the, that pharmacy. Like I mentioned, there's disease states that um, are considered specialty disease states. So I've listed them here. I'm not going to go through them in detail, but you can see that a lot of these disease states have a smaller patient population, some of the outliers being oncology or HIV. Um, but a lot of these products are really used to treat niche disease states, smaller disease states that aren't common in the, in the general population. So in summary, really what's so special about specialty? Um, there's a few considerations. One is that it requires a higher level of patient training and education. So like I mentioned, some of these are injectable or infusible products. So if a patient's going to be administering an injection at home, it oftentimes requires a little bit more hands-on training with the patient when it comes to the device, how to use it. There's dozens of different devices out there oftentimes for medications that are used to treat the same disease states. There's also a potential for more frequent or severe side effects. I'll talk about REMS in a little bit. REMS are risk evaluation mitigation strategies. It's, t it's a label that's put on a drug by the FDA during the approval process. Um, and if you have a REMS tag associated with your product, there's often a lot more data that you have to collect to make sure that your product is safe in the general population. So either through clinical trials, it's been deemed that there's a severe side effect that needs to be monitored. You need to collect that information to report back to the FDA. So there's sometimes a little bit more data collection and monitoring that goes on with these products. Not taking these medications may significantly impact the expected improvements. So this is true of any medication, but even more so with specialty, just due to the disease states that we're treating. Like Kevin mentioned, some of these medications are curative, but you have to take them in order for them to be curative. So if you're treating a patient with a $30,000 medication, you want to make sure that that patient's taking the product. Otherwise, from a payer standpoint, you've just invested $30,000 in a patient that didn't take their product. So that's why there's a lot of considerations with these payer networks of, I want to work with a pharmacy that I know is going to help the patient stay on this product. And then finally, um, like I mentioned, there's rigorous patient education and monitoring. So from a specialty pharmacy standpoint, um, there's a lot more that we do to make sure that patients are taking their medications, they are achieving those outcomes. But like I mentioned at the beginning, the cost is what's going to drive a lot of how we manage these patients and the systems that we have in place to take care of patients, as well as it's going to impact our business as a pharmacy and what we can do. So moving on to that aspect of it. So what differentiates a specialty pharmacy from a traditional pharmacy? So traditional pharmacies, your community drugstore, it's going to treat the common ailments that you see in the community. Cold and flu, stomach ache, headache, those chronic disease states, high blood pressure, cholesterol. Um, and then the services that are offered by that pharmacy are going to focus on the health and well-being of the community. So cold medicines, um, prescriptions, first aid. Um, so I think we're all familiar with what a traditional pharmacy looks like. When you look at a specialty pharmacy, 
Um, specialty pharmacies can treat one specific disease state, so it may be a transplant specific oncology pharmacy, or a specialty pharmacy can treat multiple disease states. But like I said, they're going to treat those disease states that I mentioned before in those lists. And the services associated with that pharmacy are directly related, again, to the cost of those products. So when a patient starts on a specialty product, it requires us as a pharmacy to make sure the patient has prescription drug insurance or can afford the medication. So we're going to be looking at their prescription benefit plan. We're going to be looking at are there copay cards associated with this product that we can use for the patient. We're going to be looking at prior authorization support. So a prior author authorization is um, a step that an insurance company requires where if you're going to start on a high cost product or a product that requires a little bit more monitoring, uh, they usually require a prior authorization to make sure that the patient meets all the medical necessity requirements for that product. So especially when we're talking about those high cost products, a payer is going to want to make sure that before a patient starts on this, th this therapy, uh, they're, on the, they're the appropriate patient for that product. So within our pharmacies, we have about 35 individuals focused on prior authorization support. So it's an extreme burden on our health system. And then lastly is therapy management. So we're going to focus on more formalized case management specific to the drugs and the disease states for this patient, more so than a traditional pharmacy would. There's multiple different models out there for who owns and operates a specialty pharmacy. So there may be chain pharmacies that operate specialty pharmacies um, where you may have a chain, but you may have specialty pharmacies within that chain. Or for open distribution products that don't have those limited distribution pathways, anybody could dispense those specialty products. You can also have health plan or PBM owned specialty pharmacies. Um, so with those, the health plan or the PBM would own a specialty pharmacy and you can understand some of the benefits of being able to manage that cost and which patients are on those plans. Um, but I also think that that introduces some implications for Wisconsin pharmacies that we'll get into in a bit. And there's some ethical considerations with that as well. Um, I'm here representing hospitalized pharmacies. So a lot of health systems have been growing specialty pharmacies over the past five years. Once again, to focus on treating those patients, a lot of academic medical centers have regional referrals, so they're the specialty referral center for patients. So for example, UW Health is a specialty referral center for patients in Wisconsin. So we see a lot of the patients within our health system, and we think and we know that we can manage these patients better, so we want to be able to do that within the walls of our health system. And then finally, independent pharmacies. So there's a lot of independent pharmacies out there also that, that contribute to the specialty pharmacy marketplace. As far as some of the back-end considerations for what a specialty pharmacy has to have in place to participate in this marketplace, I mentioned some of the contracting. So we have to be able to access some of those limited distribution products and treat, treat the patients that we care for. So making sure we can access the products and working with manufacturers to get access. Looking at reimbursement and, and negotiating our way into payer networks that are a little bit more restricted within specialty pharmacy. And then accreditation is a growing uh, requirement to be included in a lot of payer networks for specialty pharmacy. So there's about three accrediting bodies out there that will accredit specialty pharmacies. So it's another hoop that we have to jump through to, to treat our patients. There's logistics. Like I mentioned, as a tertiary care center in Wisconsin, we have patients that come from anywhere in Wisconsin. So in order to get products to those patients so they don't have to travel to Madison every month and they need their medication, we invest a lot in mail service as well. And with these products, a lot of them being refrigerated, we need to consider how are we going to, in the hot summers of Wisconsin and cold winters of Wisconsin, keep that product in the right temperature range. So, range. so there's a lot of um, procedures that we have in place for that. I've mentioned the financial services, just making sure that patients can afford these medications before we start them on it. And then also clinical services. I'll share what our clinical model is, but specialty pharmacies typically have more rigorous, formalized case management for these patients um, just to make sure that we're monitoring labs, we're monitoring outcomes um, to keep patients with the, with the best possible outcome. So there's different rationale for why a manufacturer or a payer may use a specialty pharmacy. Um, so if a drug manufacturer wants to limit their product to a specialty pharmacy, they're considering lower distribution costs because you're working with one, um, one entity versus multiple entities and having to negotiate all those contracts. They're streamlined access to utilization data which ties into what I was mentioning with the REMS below, but a lot of these manufacturers, their goal is to get their products used by more patients and prescribed by more physicians. So if I use one specialty pharmacy, that specialty pharmacy has all the information on the prescriber and the patients that are using that. So they can use that to go and market to certain regions that maybe aren't prescribing their product more, market it to certain specialty physicians that aren't using their product more, and once again, their goal is to increase the volume of their product that's being used. And it helps if they do have a REMS program to collect that data. They have a one-stop shop versus trying to get that data from multiple different pharmacies. From a health plan's perspective, um, large PBMs have financial benefit in steering to affiliated specialty pharmacies. So if you're a PBM and you own a specialty pharmacy, it makes sense to have one hand pay the other and try to 
to keep the specialty pharmacy products within your pharmacy. Um, and then th there's also perception of improved quality in patient care. But um, as somebody that's been in this market for a while, I can guarantee you that these specialty, mar specialty pharmacy networks are not based on quality in patient care. A lot of it's based on financials and politics. So there's a lot of uh, data that I have that can demonstrate that we take better care of patients than other pharmacies, but we're still limited from treating our own patients within our pharmacies. So if you look at who's in the specialty pharmacy marketplace, um, you can see a lot, of, a lot of the top players are those PBM or health plan owned specialty pharmacies. I'd say these are also the specialty pharmacies that are under, under the most scrutiny um, with, that Kevin was mentioning as well. So if I'm a pay, patient that has one of these PBMs, I'm forced to use their national mail order pharmacy in a lot of those situations. Um, and if you look at the bottom, all other retail, mail, long-term care, and specialty pharmacies, that's where UW Health and a lot of other academic medical centers fall. And you can see that as a, as a group, we still make up a sizable chunk of the marketplace, $22 billion. Um, so it's pretty substantial. However, the leverage that those big players have is um, extremely important when we look at some of those marketplace pressures. Um, so a little bit about UW Health Pharmacy Services, just to ha have a little bit more practical um, added service to this presentation. So we do have 14 different pharmacies. So we straddle both that traditional pharmacy as well as specialty pharmacy marketplace. Um, and our primary focus, like I mentioned, is to treat our patients in our health system. So we think that we're best situated to take care of those patients. When we look at what offerings do we have for patients, we have a structured outcomes management program that I'll talk through what that looks like. Um, and it's specific to product and disease state. Um, one of the unique things about our health system, we are the first health system to incorporate this into our electronic health record. So for all of the patients that we treat, we're able to, through a navigator, document what the patient's on, the side effects associated with that, review those with the patient, review labs, review clinical notes. And then once we're completed with doing that, that's all documented in the health record for the physician and care team to see. So it's a very transparent system. And especially when you consider that patients see their specialty physician every eight to 12 months, when we're talking about these disease states that we have to manage acutely, um, having that monthly check-in and knowing how patients are doing is extremely important to those care providers. So we have great relationships with our clinics and providers, and then um, a lot of the requirements for payer inclusion is specialty uh, training for all of our pharmacists, so we do that as well. So what does it look like for a specialty pharmacy to manage these patients? This is the UW Health model. So whenever a patient starts, we enroll them in our program. Um, like I mentioned, there's a lot that goes in up front to make sure that patients can afford their medications. So we have 35 different individuals that are focused on different disease states to assist clinics and patients with starting these products. We perform a patient review. So every month, we don't auto send anything to patients. We're calling patients five to seven days before their prescriptions are due. And then we're reviewing all this information with the patient. Like I mentioned, we're looking at lab results, clinic visit documentation, looking at their adherence and what they've been filling with us. And then we review with a patient any questions, concerns that they have, look at the side effects, look at the outcomes, and make sure that the patient is achieving what we want them to achieve with their medications. And then that's documented and shared with the care team. So it's a very transparent process. We're able to follow up if there's any issues with the physician. You can see we fill for tens of thousands of patients per year. Um, so you can see, like I mentioned, the patient numbers for these disease states are relatively low. This is a subset of a, a payer that we work with um, and some of the data that we share with them. Um, but for a few of the disease states, looking at the small number of patient populations that we serve here, it's still a resource intensive process. Um, but general adherence rate is the, is the benchmark for a lot of specialty disease states um, when you're just looking across the board. And in general, 80% is a good adherence rate when you're looking at medication adherence. So adherence is just looking at how often are patients filling their medications and making sure that they're filling it continuously. So you can see through the processes that we have set up within our specialty pharmacies, we knock that out of the water in a lot of cases. So HIV, we're almost at 100% adherence rate. Oncology, multiple sclerosis. And oncology is usually a tricky one because if you think about those products, there's a lot of side effects and um, bad ill effects associated with those. So it's really important to keep those patients on those products to achieve those benefits and talk through those symptoms and side effects with patients. So what's the rub? Why, why are we talking about this today? Um, so just based on my experience, there's a lot of implications that I think we have in Wisconsin. And it's a multifactorial problem, as Kevin mentioned. So I'm going to kind of go through some of the big picture issues on how this impacts patients in Wisconsin, just based on what we see in our pharmacies and our health system, and then also how it impacts the business of pharmacy in Wisconsin-owned businesses. So to summarize kind of the cause and effect of a specialty pharmacy product, so the first step is the manufacturer launches a new cost specialty, high cost specialty product. 
So the payer's going to react, right? So the payers have to evaluate the products and determine if they're going to be on formulary or not. And there's a lot of pressure on payers to put these medications on formulary because a lot of the times they are the newer treatment model for patients um, and benefits have been seen within clinical trials. So a payer is going to react by putting these medications on a specialty tier um, and then also requiring a prior authorization for these patients. Like I mentioned, this is the step just to make sure that with this high cost product, the patient meets the criteria needed to be on this product. And then finally, if a payer has a restricted network, by being within that specialty tier, it's going to be shifted to that specialty network. So the impact on patients, so with a specialty tier product, oftentimes patients have a higher out-of-pocket cost. Um, so this could be through a copay or also coinsurance. Some patients have up to 20% coinsurance on products. So if you think about a high-cost oncology product, that's going to really impact the patient's um, monthly out-of-pocket. Also with prior authorizations, um, a lot of these prior authorizations, when a patient receives a prior authorization on a product, it lasts for about 12 months. Um, so the patient has to first get approval to start the therapy and then every 12 months get renewal for that therapy um, to continue on it. So there can be gaps in or delays in initiation to treatment. So some of these prior authorizations when we work with patients takes up to two to three months to get a patient started on a product. Um, and then if that prior authorization lapses and it's not renewed, a patient could see a gap in therapy. So it definitely impacts patients um, when we talk about these specialty products. And then also they may be forced to go outside of their common um, pharmacy that they, they typically use and use a mail order pharmacy or a, a different pharmacy. So it increases the fragmentation of care for patients as well. How our pharmacies are impacted are a preferred pharmacy in Wisconsin. So we may be unable to fill the specialty product for the patient if we're not in network. Like I mentioned, care fragmentation reduces our ability to manage the patient holistically. So even if we're managing all other aspects of care for the patient, we may be unable to fill their prescription for them. <coughs> and then another important note um, to, to, to have out there is that in general in the marketplace, generic uh, reimbursement for non-specialty products is, continues to go down. So profitability and sustainability for independent pharmacies that don't fill specialty products is, is impacted drastically. So Anybody in Wisconsin has probably seen independent pharmacies close within the past 6 to 12 months as a result of poor profitability. So with these specialty products, they generally have a favorable profitability and a favorable product mix for pharmacies. But if we're locked out as Wisconsin pharmacies to fill these prescriptions, then we're basically filling everything else that we don't make money on. And then the other pharmacies that are within that network um, receive the revenue associated with these products. So it's a tricky situation to be in from a Wisconsin pharmacy standpoint. So I've hit these points home already, but cost is going to be the biggest impact to patient. Access and streamlined care is going to be an impact to patient. Rural patients are going to have fewer options. If they typically use their community pharmacy there, they may be forced to use uh, a pharmacy outside of their hometown. And then fragmentation of care, it's been demonstrated that, you know, fractioning patients into different pharmacies increases the likelihood of medication errors from happening, just because as a pharmacy, I don't know what that other pharmacy is filling for the patient. So. Um, we always encourage patients to use one home pharmacy, um, and this kind of goes against that mantra. Like I mentioned, specialty is a small volume of what we fill, um, but it makes up a sizable chunk of our costs as an organization, as well as the associated revenue. Um, and traditional pharmacy, we have to fill a lot in order to break even. Um, so it's a tricky marketplace to be in. So with pharmacies, as we're carved out, um, and unable to fill these products, even if we can provide and meet those quality standards that payers have, it's going to impact our profitability. There's care fragmentation for patients, care fragmentation for what we can do as a health system, um, and then there's also complex reimbursement. So it literally is like a game of minesweeper when we're trying to get reimbursed for a prescription. Um, we'll sometimes know up front what our reimbursement is going to be, but there's an increasing number of audits. Um, some of them are three to four years after we fill the prescription, um, and they're looking at things that generally are probably unfair practices and taking money back from prescriptions that we filled. So it's an extremely challenging marketplace to be in right now. Um, so when a lot of that favorable product mix is pulled out of Wisconsin pharmacies, it's challenging to, to meet those needs. So just general considerations. So first is that pharmacy providers should be paid adequately both for product and service. So we've always been paid for product in the community pharmacy setting. Um, but it's really important to think about the services that we provide, especially with specialty products. There's a lot more resources that we're dedicating to these services that we're not getting reimbursed for. Also, health plans should engage with pharmacists and providers to make sure that we're developing those meaningful care pathways. I can tell you that we're all in the same boat. We want to take care of the patient and make sure they're achieving outcomes at the lowest cost possible. 
um, and there's not a lot of collaboration that typically goes into that process. And then also, if I can meet a payer's network requirements to be included in a pharmacy, in my mind, I should be able to participate in that pharmacy network. So right now, that's not necessarily the case. That even if I can demonstrate that I can care for the patient just as well or better um, than a national specialty pharmacy, I may still be locked out of caring for our own patient at UW Health. So there's a few um, things that I'll leave, the, leave before the question and answer session. So the first is thinking about what can we do about this. So one thing is looking at drug pricing transparency and limits. Um, so this is something that would promote and support pricing transparency and price hike limitation legislation for Wisconsin. Um, and what's been seen around the nation and other, other states that have done this, they require manufacturers to submit data on pricing and inflation. Um, and any, there's penalties for egregious price hikes. So like I mentioned, a lot of these medications go through double to triple inflation compared to what general inflation is. So Vermont enacted some legislation in June 2016 or passed some legislation in June 2016. And as of last year, there's been 13 other states that have had some considerations for this. So it just requires manufacturers to submit that information to the state legislator and then allow some, some review and penalties if, if some of those are out of bounds. I've hit on any willing provider considerations already, but the general, con general concern here is that if I can demonstrate contract requirements and meet those contract requirements, I should be allowed to care for patients. Um, so just looking at language that would allow for network inclusion where pharmacies are able to meet those requirements. And then just my last recommendation is looking at a helping hand. So like I mentioned, this is a very complex and tricky uh, marketplace and pharmacies reimbursement is very complex. So as a legislator, it can be confusing. If you need assistance, there's great um, work being done by Pharmacy Society of Wisconsin and trying to assist legislators with what are, what's supportive that can help Wisconsin pharmacies and patients. Um, and then you can always reach out to your pharmacists in your, um, in your, in your areas to, to help with that too. So with that, I'd like to thank you all for being here. Um, and I think there's a question and answer session now. Thank you very much. Um, now we're going to have about 10 minutes of question and answers. Um, and then if the legislators at the table, you can use your microphones. If not, there's staff that have microphones for people in the audience. And I, I guess I'll go first. When you were, um, Dr. Look, when you were talking about um, marketing, um, you, their share of the pie, has that increased as, uh, as pharmaceuticals have um, use more and more TV commercials. It used to be just the purple pill, and now we have more specialty drugs like opioid constipation and 24-hour, um, whatever, 24-hour when yeah. you're blind. Or, so anyway, is, has that share increased? So that's a good question, and, and because a lot of times this information is not reported in a clear, easy, uh, consistent way across manufacturers and, and across the industry, it's, it's hard to tell um, how that pie has shifted, but in terms of absolute spending, like the dollar amounts, it has gone up, but in terms of how that relates, I mean, the, the figure I showed earlier uh, was an estimate because a lot of times these, this information isn't clear or it's, it, you know, there are assumptions that have to be made to sort of tease out where the money is going and what it's being spent on. Um, so I guess part of the answer is, I think so, and part of the answer is we're not entirely sure. And I think part of, uh, part of my talk is, is recognizing that there are areas where we do have some knowledge of things and there are areas where there's still a lot of uncertainty. So I tried to point out a little bit of what we do know and what we don't know as well. Representative Tittle. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Colsty, for putting this on. It's very informative. Uh, it's these guys. <laughs> well, for chairing it or, or arranging it. Thank you very much. Um, I have a couple of questions. Uh, one of them, your slides, um, I think it's Dr. Look, you had something up there about one prescription was 80 some thousand dollars and it was like $900 in Egypt. Okay. What is the rationale behind that cost difference? I mean, I, may, I, mean, I know I'm asking you to speculate probably, but. Yeah, so uh, I mentioned the fact that we have such a unique healthcare system and that. Um, you know, we don't have the price controls that are seen in a lot of other countries and the reimbursement or, or the prices paid for prescription drugs vary widely across the world because uh, sometimes the size of the country has an impact on they can negotiate better rates. Sometimes they have um, policies in place such that 
our price is the average of other countries in our area so these these price determinations are very tricky from an international sense in that every single health care system is a little bit unique um, some of the things that we've been hearing are that um, you know because of the low prices that are being paid in other countries um, the u.s. is paying more to help pay for the costs of research and development of these drugs and that things like price controls would um, prevent research and development from going on and we would lose access to these innovative new medications whether that's true or not I'll, I'll leave up to others to uh, to make that statement but there is not a clear stated like here's the one rationale for why this occurs but those are some of the factors that sort of underlie things and I don't know if Joe you have any other thoughts on that I mean I think the simple answer to your question is that they're priced how they are because the marketplace allows it so there's nothing that stops a manufacturer from releasing a price of $125,000 the marketplace adjusts and allows it somehow um, so it's a, like Kevin said it's tricky to compare our country to a, a different country with a different healthcare system but that's the, the simple answer and then my other question I have is that you talked about um, price transparency don't we already have that in Wisconsin, uh, like a trice, price transparency on prescription drugs? Um, or is that, am I misunderstanding that? So um, there are some uh, PBMs or pharmacy benefit managers that operate under transparent business models. Um, and looking nationally, they make up a very small proportion of PBMs but there are some companies that operate with more or less transparent business models um, but there are still concerns being expressed that even in some of these models they may not be as transparent as they claim to be um, so but there is no formal I'm not aware of any formal transparency legislation I think there's been some bills under discussion and and things that have been proposed but uh, as of right now there there's nothing formal because okay. it, it's very timely I, I had a friend of mine I was talking to over the weekend and he actually sent me an email about a certain prescription that he was getting. It was Moda, Modafinil? Yeah, Modafinil. Modafinil, okay. That's why yeah. you go to pharmacy school to learn how to pronounce it. All right, good. <laughs> good. Well, anyhow, he was getting this filled at, uh, a, well, the biggest, largest box store in the United States. And um, I won't name the name. Um, the prescription costs were like $1,200 a month as he was paying for this. And then he went over to... Um, a club that's not related to this other box store but it's a competing club and he ended up getting them for roughly about forty six dollars a month compared to twelve hundred how does that how how can that be conscionable? I mean it's the same medication I mean how do they do that is that one making that much more yeah so um, part of it can depend on if this is something that's being paid for through insurance because nope. typically when insurance cash. is involved it's the same price everywhere but when it's a cash price then in those situations the pharmacies have more flexibility on what they can charge for a price um, typically uh, when insurance is involved they negotiate between the pharmacy and the insurance company like we'll give you five bucks to dispense this medication but when no insurance is involved uh, here's that point where you don't have that insurance company acting on your behalf uh, to negotiate for discounts or rebates and so you are going to see very great um, differences depending on things like what does it cost me to acquire this drug at my company what do we set as a reasonable profit level and so yeah that's sort of a, a rather extreme case actually but it's not uncommon for prices cash prices without insurance to vary widely well maybe Maybe that's the first step we should be looking at. Um, Representative Reamer, we'll take one more. Representative Reamer, and then I think everybody will be available afterwards to talk. Great. Thanks, Rep. Colsey, and thank you both for your um, presentations. <coughs> Dr. Look, you talked about the, the breakdown of the allocation of revenue, and Dr. Cesar, you talked about the sort of traditional versus specialty drugs. Is, is there could either or both of you talk about how the allocation of revenue for R&D, marketing, and profits differs by different kinds of drugs, specific drugs, or maybe the categories that you that you mentioned? I mean, I think like Kevin mentioned, a lot of that information is not publicly available. So I'm not aware of any 
any data that would show between a manufacturer what how much they spend on research and development for their drug versus another. But it does vary. I mean, there's definitely manufacturers that spend more and manufacturers that spend less. Yeah, and um, because of the, the transparency, I mean, some of the drugs are developed in-house by the manufacturers, in which case they have a better sense of what the cost of developing those medications were. But we're also seeing a lot of, say, small biotech firms that are creating new medications, and then they're being bought out by the larger pharmaceutical manufacturers, and then prices are being set by someone who didn't do necessarily the research and development on that drug, or at least the initial uh, costs that went into that. So um, I think... Um, you know, things like some of the hepatitis C drugs were that way as well, where some of the smaller firms had developed them and then they were bought out by larger firms and the, the development was finalized so that you have different, different hands in different pots and so it's, a, it's harder to assess some of the costs of those medications. Thank you very much. Um, our next speaker will be um, Rachel Kearns Henry. Um, first of all, I just want to say that I was at a national conference with her and uh, it was a very bipartisan conference and everybody said we were the luckiest state ever to have her in our state. So there you go. Um, our next feature is Rachel, Director of the Medicaid Bureau of Benefits Management at the Wisconsin Department of Health Services. She has served in multiple leadership positions at DHS over the past 10 years and currently oversees Medicaid benefit policies, a nine, $900 million pharmacy benefit program managed care delivery model for over 700,000 individuals and a quality improvement in health care delivery reform strategies. Ms. Currens Henry received her master's degree in public policy studies from the University of Chicago's Harris School of Public Policy. Thank you very much. Thank you very much and thank you to all of you for putting on this presentation. It's nice to be here and to shed some light on how the Medicaid program fits into this, this national dialogue. I want to acknowledge and, and thank many members of the state Medicaid team who are here today. Um, uh, well, that was a very nice compliment that you gave. Um, I'm very, we can't, I don't do this alone. I'm here with a team and we have wonderful employees at the Medicaid program who really are mission driven to help manage the cost of the program. So today, what my, I've had a it's very nice setup that we've had in terms of understanding the landscape that we're working at. My goals today in the next 20 minutes are to help provide a bit of perspective about what are the federal regulations and that regulatory framework that makes managing Medicaid pharmacy programs unique from commercial management. And then with that regulatory framework, what does that mean we have in our toolbox? And then what does that mean we don't have in our toolbox? I want to show you some statistics on how we're doing to show then matching up how does our data show us how we're doing with our existing toolbox, what's missing, it, to set up what are some alternatives, which Eileen will be presenting on as well. So that's, for, that's our goal. So I won't bore you with this too. I'll try not to these first parts. So the first concept here is that under the Social Security Act, there are 25, 29 categories of Medicaid services. What's interesting is that prescribed drugs is actually an optional state plan category, coverage category. So Medicaid programs have the option of doing that. Every program does administer a pharmacy program because obviously it, it is an important part of the healthcare delivery system and saves you cost on managing any other expenditures that you have. Now, the interesting part is that under 1927, you have a very defined rule that, uh, that outlines payment for covered outpatient drugs. And in that rule, it defines those, the, the covered outpatient drugs for the purposes of prescribed drugs for what Medicaid programs mu must cover. And then there's details about the Medicaid drug rebate program. And this is really important with understanding how Medicaid programs operate. So part of the deal here was that in establishing a federal national drug rebate program at the federal level, there was this deal cut that basically said, okay, drug manufacturers, we need your help at, you need to reduce your costs for some of our programs. So to do that, we're going to have these defined rebate formulas. <coughs> but then, in exchange, 
Medicaid programs that choose, again, because of that first element of 1905, Medicaid programs that choose to participate in the pharmacy program must cover all FDA-approved drugs for any medically accepted indication. So again, just laying a, a, a land, a, a little bit of a marker there, because what that means is that if there is a medically accepted indication, well, that means that the Medicaid program needs to have some avenue to cover that drug. Now, there's policies that we can do, and we're going to get to that. But again, we can't have a restrictive formulary that says we just don't cover it. Um, it's, it's off the table. It's an option for people. Now, the other, we do have a few areas that are excluded from coverage. If a drug is less than effective, as defined by the FDA, we don't have to cover it. If a drug is experimental or doesn't have medically accepted indications, we wouldn't cover that as well. Additionally, there's another portion of SSA that has a specific uh, language called the Early and Periodic Screening Diagnostic and Treatment Services, EPSDT. In Wisconsin, we call it health check. That's what you're going to have heard. Now, the reason why I'm bringing this up, because it's an important element to understand for the Medicaid program, is that all Medicaid cover services, whether mandatory or optional, must be covered for kids under 21 years of age if they are medically necessary services. So again, in terms of can the Medicaid program, and, and again, I'm not saying should, I'm saying can legally the Medicaid program say we're not covering a certain drug for a child under age 21 for if it was a medically necessary service. And that's where we're saying, no, we can't. We are by law, again, required to do that. And that's, the lands that's a bit of the landscape we have. So what that means in terms of our toolbox, if you will, for how we manage the program in terms of uh, it's a bit different than some of the items that um, my fellow panelist, Dr. Cesar, brought up, right? And I'm going to try to highlight a few of those differences in terms of a commercial um, toolbox versus what, what the Medicaid program uses. So the first concept is we have to use our purchasing power and the size of our program to our advantage. And so you hear this sometimes in terms of how, what's, the deli what's our delivery system? So. We have 1.2 million members in the Medicaid program. We have about 700,000 of them that are in managed care. We have 19 health plans. If you take those numbers and you were to think about the size of the purchasing power and having 19 health plans separately administer a benefit, that reduces your purchasing power. So the state of Wisconsin has, has made a decision since 2008 to administer the program so we can maximize our purchasing power and get rebate, collect, rebate collections by doing, a, uh, by, by doing it in-house, if you will, by having the Medicaid program administer the entire benefit across the populations, and then we work in partnership with our health plans administering the, the medical benefit. Um, so the other things that we can do are we think about how our benefits are delivered in terms of whether it's on the medical side or the pharmacy benefit. So sometimes you're looking at, are we going to, based on if this is a really high cost specialty drug or that requires certain types of um, additional services, well, should we make a decision not to pay for it under the uh, point of sale, like a, a, a dispensing program, or should we have that be administered in a medical setting. And so we make decisions and we do sometimes turn on and turn off how we pay for drugs regarding certain avenues. We do a lot in terms of thinking about market competition and thinking about how we do selective contracting to obtain lower cost. So for example, diabetic supplies, we work and we negotiate with a a group of states where we have rolling bids from manufacturers that come in and we have three preferred agents. And then again, if you want to, th these are our agents. These are our three preferred areas that we'd like you to use. If you choose not to, um, you have to go through prior authorization and you have to go through paperwork in order to get to those other products. Again, so sometimes we hear um, about how, uh, you know, challenges from providers about how we don't like prior authorization. But what I think is really important for members of the legislature to hear and to understand in terms of how you manage the Medicaid program for pharmacy, we absolutely need it. Because if we didn't have that tool, you would, again, based on that federal regulation, 
you, you need to have some sort of ability to have a preferred agent over a non-preferred agent in a way to determine um, how do you get to that non-preferred agent. You need to have some sort of mechanism. And you need that because, again, being on our preferred drug list means that you have, it, it's similar to a formulary, but it's not, again, because it's not restrictive. But it makes it so that way there is, um, you, you're, 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 we're trying to entice getting better supplemental rebate offers from drug companies to get better deals for the state. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about that um, in, on the coming slides. The other things that we do is we look at and we monitor the cost of certain specialty products, and we do have a special specialty pricing program as well, and we look at uh, certain criteria that we use. We have prior authorization. There's times where we have a simple phone process that a pharmacist used to, to obtain approval. And then there's some areas where we have a clinical form, which would be a paper or an electronic r review. And then we also have brand medically necessary, which is essentially asking providers to justify the use of a brand name product over a generic equivalent. The additional tools that we have, um, we, we work on alerts and we try to look at pricing policies and system edits to help us be smart on how we run the program. So we have quantity limits, early refills, three-month supplies, diagnosis restrictions on certain areas. Um, we also have worked in partnership over the years with our Pharmacy Society of Wisconsin to pay pharmacists for value-added services and medical consultate and medical reviews uh, called the Medicaid Therapy Management Program. In addition to the drug rebate program, we also have 340B pricing at the federal level. And what I'm bringing this up here again, it's, it's one avenue. If you're going to be in the 340B program and get those discounts, you can't get the, the drug rebate program discounts as well. So there's choices that you make in terms of where are you shifting streams of funding. We also think about in terms of pricing. We just went through a, a large pricing change. Again, that was mostly federally driven. As Dr. Look mentioned, there have been years of histories in the nation of those compendia prices um, that were, were inflated pricing. And so state Medicaid programs across the nation were paying more than they should have been and paying for profit. One of the things that's important in the covered outpatient drug rule is that state Medicaid programs specifically are not supposed to pay for profit for the cost of drugs. We pay for the cost and we pay a reasonable professional dispensing fee, those two elements. At the federal level, what's happened in terms of what is the actual ingredient cost that we pay, because of that history of having those inflated compendia prices, the feds have created this national um, uh, tool that collects prices about what actually is the cost of a drug for manufacturers and for, phar for pharmacies, actually. How much does it cost a pharmacy to obtain a drug? That new federal tool is now how we're pricing ingredient cost. We just went to that model on April 1, and then we adjusted our dispensing fees. So we adjusted our dispensing fees to be a differential um, based on size of volume. So we think about those types of trade-offs as well. <laughs> we're just getting the lights back on here. I would note as well, uh, drug utilization review is a federal requirement as well in terms of uh, a federally required that programs have these types of committees that are advising the departments on how to manage their programs. And a little bit, in, in just a minute, I'm going to give an example of the type of work that our DUR board does, uh, specifically related to a prescriber education approach. One of the things that we also have in managing our program is called a lock-in program. And, and we, hear, we, we get questions on this as well. And why this is important is that let's say we see that there is somebody who is um, not adhering to uh, certain policies or we see um, abuse of drugs um, in certain ways that is not beneficial to the program. Um, there are many times that what we can do is we can lock a person into a prescriber and a pharmacy to help make sure that they're not shopping around for certain types of drugs and certain types of products from different providers. Um, so this is, again, a tool, and, and if there's questions on that program, I'm happy to answer that as well. So 
what's not in our toolbox? Well, this discussion that Dr. Cesar said about drug tiers with differential copayments, that's not in our toolbox. Well, why? Well, because there's a federal law that requires individuals pay no more than 5% of their household annual income on cost sharing. So if you think about who we, who we serve as the Medicaid program, we, we serve people who don't have high incomes. And so thinking about using um, high copayments would require certain exceptions to federal law to make sure that you weren't exceeding a threshold. Now, I do know we do have copayments, but they range between about 50 cents to $3 for, our, for pharmaceuticals. The other thing we, we don't do is we don't have, again, that restrictive formulary to say that we're covering this, but we're not covering this other program. We don't have generic-only coverage. We also don't have a single statewide formulary. Um, that's something that has been discussed in the past on um, could the state Medicaid program and the state ETF and the state Department of Corrections all come together and say, well, what should we cover? And have, a, have a, just a state decision and therefore use purchasing power. I think it's a great idea, and I think it's something that I, it, it's, it's interesting to try to figure out how we do. The challenge that we have, we tried to do it on micro levels. For example, when these hepatitis C products came out, we convened our ETF and DOC partners and said, all right, what can we do if we all come together and figure out how we manage the hepatitis C programs? The challenge for the Medicaid program, and you're going to see this a little bit later in the cost, is that Again, the drug rebate provisions and the dollars that we get in make, it, make our choices different. It make our, our decisions on what we should cover end up being different from ETF or DOC's decisions based on the types of dollars that we get back from manufacturers. And I'm going to share, share that as well. The other thing in terms of restrictive networks of participating pharmacies, um, we, we don't do that. We do adhere to any willing provider provisions in the Medicaid program, so meaning we have about 1,600 uh, pharmacies across the state, and we have almost 100% participation in the Medicaid program. Now, what we do in certain areas, there's some times where, for example, hemophilia products, what we did is we convened certain, um, uh, certain providers who work on hemophilia, and we said, we're not going to have, again, a Medicaid certification policy that says you can't be in the Medicaid program. But what we do think is good at times is to develop centers of excellence and policies to say, if you're going to be providing hemophilia products, for example, well, we should have, there's best practices or centers of excellence or criteria that, that are out there nationally that we should say, this is a policy that if you choose to provide this product that we think you should follow. So again, if you can just kind of see the difference of how do we understand where are the restrictions and then how can we use those restrictions and perhaps put policy in place to again, incent better quality. That's, that's what we're doing. The example of the DUR project that we do, one of the things that we had was the stimulants drug class is actually our highest uh, drug class. Uh, we've seen growth both on children and in adults using stimulants. Part of what we've seen as well is that um, the, the dosing thresholds um, were, were very high, uh, higher compared to what the literature said they should be. And so we engaged in a prescriber education effort over the course of, again, as you can see here, this is not something that's just a one-time effort that we do. This is a thoughtful, engaged prescriber education process over a course of years where we worked on education on those dosing, uh, those dosing thresholds, helped simply provide education to say, did you know that your patient it was on these types of dosages, and that's uh, above what the standards should be. And, and again, we were very pleased by this initiative because that effort saw a 50% reduction in the number of children who received the daily dosage after we implemented it. So just another example of the type of work that we can do in terms of our threshold. And this is just, again, a blow-up of that slide that shows you um, the percentage, the decreases in, based on the pre-intervention, post-intervention effort. So with the toolkit that we have, how are we doing? That's the question. So what this slide shows you, 
the total pay, the, the red or orange line is showing you the total dollars that the pharmacy program um, issued out the door. So what you're going to see about this trend is that looks pretty similar to what Dr. Look showed us about the senior care program, right? But what we, we have to really take into consideration for the Medicaid program is that's not our true line. Our costs actually are the blue line. Because, what that's the, because part of what we do is we're able to get rebate dollars back from the, federal from the manufacturers um, and make sure that we're managing our program. So as you can see, this, this again just is showing you on a pure dollar perspective what it looks like. I would note um, in 2009, for example, we recouped about 40% of our costs in the drug rebate program. Now we're at about 60%. So again, we're getting about 60% of, of dollars back. Now, this is again why that, that, that poses a different environment and a different question for Medicaid programs as to sometimes the cost of certain products look different for us than they do in the commercial environment. Now, what's important as well when you think about this is this is again just t telling you the total dollars going out the door. But how does it compare when we actually talk about dollars that we're spending on a per member per member base per uh, excuse me per member per month basis now what i see what i want to highlight here is that you're going to notice that on a per member per month basis we are actually spending less per member per month at managing the pharmacy program for the medicaid population in 2016 than we did in in 2009 we have held costs and, we, and, and I would actually argue we bet the cost curve in that regard because if you think about it, this is not adjusted for inflation. If you just took that 3196 um, figure and adjusted it for calculation or just for inflation alone, it would be about 3632 PMPM. So in that, in that regard, we've held the line in terms of the cost. And so where is the growth though and what does that mean in terms of managing a specialty program? If you take the specialty drugs out versus the non-specialty program, what this shows you again is where we're doing really well on a per member per month basis is on, again, the non-specialty drugs where we have an, our, our per member per month is $24.83. So what this, I like to think that this line shows us is that the tools that the Medicaid program has right now in terms of managing cost we're using those tools well, and we're bringing down cost in our program. Where we see growth is, again, on the price of specialty drugs. And you can see it varies. It's, it's been, um, uh, you saw a, a decrease when you went from 2009 to 2011, and then we've seen a steady increase as we continue to go up. And just in the last four years, we've had an increase of 40% in the last four years. Now. The other thing I would note is that part of what we are doing, as I mentioned, is we try to use market pressure where we can to negotiate and to, to bring down our cost. So, for example, on the hepatitis C example that was raised in terms of those, those initial costs were $84,000 per, per, you know, per, what was it, per pill? Per course of treatment. Course of treatment. Um, now, that put Medicaid programs and Department of Corrections programs at a very, in a very difficult position because there's a disproportionate amount of the population who ends up having those disease states who are managed by the Medicaid program. What were we going to do? We decided to use um, the tool of our preferred drug list and to push the uh, pharma against one another to try to get, bring down the cost. And with that time, we had kind of a, a you know, it was the, of, of, the, of, of the understanding that we're going to open up access as price comes down. And that's what we try to do. But we, we, it, we have to be careful in that regard, too, because we also need to make sure we're thinking of the consumer perspective and making sure that we're adhering to federal laws that say if there's a medically accepted indication, you need to cover those products. I would note today we have seen about a 50% reduction in the cost of the hepatitis C drugs for the Medicaid program over the past three years based on those efforts. So again, some of the tools where there is competition in the market, the Medicaid program is able to use our purchasing power to bring down costs.
again, in terms of volume, while we have those extremely high costs for the specialty drug program, you can see and you can see that our growth of specialty claims volume has been increasing. It is very small compared to the volume of the non-specialty drugs. And this as well correlates to national statistics and, statistics and the statistics you heard from my fellow colleagues today about the 80-20 divide. And in particular, when you look here in terms of the, of the Medicaid program, this is how you see the, the trends as a percentage of net paid the distribution of dollars that we're spending on non-specialty drugs versus specialty drugs. And again, you can see that growth as a percentage of the Medicaid program spending on specialty drugs is increasing. And so where does this leave us? Well, um, this gets to the, what, what does our data show us? I, I think the data shows us that um, those traditional tools that we have at managing the program for the most part when there's competition in the market, we're able to use those tools to manage the program. Where you're seeing the specialty increases and where you're seeing um, challenges for Medicaid programs is in what to do about the actual cost of pricing. Because again, what you pay for the drug, it's federally defined for us to say you need to actually pay the average acquisition cost. So we have to pay that at that as our ingredient cost. And again, as you've heard today, that's out of our control. That's not defined by us. That ends up being created by manufacturers. So some efforts um, that we've been part of, and, and it, it, there's this concept of how do you move, you, we always hear about value-based purchasing arrangements. And how do we say, how do we essentially make sure that we're getting quality and uh, uh, value out of our programs for what are we pricing. For pharmacy, that's difficult to do in our current environment. There's been some efforts, um, and we've been part at the table um, with a collaborative of states to look at this concept of, they, they're calling it the Smart D Collaborative, which is essentially trying to pull states together to say, can we negotiate with a manufacturer to say, if you have an FDA approved indication for a specific disease state and, you, and you're, it's saying that you're going to actually see a, an improvement, well, we want to hold you to that and we want to pay you for that improvement. Now, that's a challenge to do because that's not something that you can do overnight. Um, programs and in, in essentially countries that do this end up negotiating deals for the entire country that are sometimes over the course of, of five years or longer in terms of, of, of terms of those pricings. But it is definitely something that, again, state Medicaid programs are starting to talk to one another to figure out, is, this some, is there an opportunity here? The other challenge for the Medicaid program is the concept about orphan drugs. And we've heard this, this concept uh, this talked about by our panelists, and we've also heard the drug Spinraza come up as an example. Now, I, I'm just giving context. Well, why am I, why, how does this impact the Medicaid program specifically? Well, when, I, when we think about the orphan drugs and the types of disease states that were, these drugs are being created for, they tend to be disease states that end up making somebody eligible for the Medicaid program because they usually end up meaning that you're able to obtain eligibility through a disability to, through the type of disease state. So what that means is that the Medicaid program ends up paying a disproportionate share of the types of specialty drugs for these orphan drug categories than, than commercial payments do. And many times you would have policies where, um, like with, when Spinraza came out, right, we, we need to figure out, well, how are we going to pay for this drug? And because of the FDA indications, we can't, we're, we're not limiting who can necessarily get that drug. We are going to be putting out and paying for $750,000 uh, for a course of treatment for a child. Um, and that does put a strain on the Medicaid budget. Um, and there's not, there's not really much we can do except for um, making sure that we are working with our partners to make sure that that concept of adherence 
and making sure that if the Medicaid program is going to make that investment, that we're following those coverage policies, and that way we make sure that it, it is um, that we're reviewing if it's working. If it, the drug isn't working, then that's when we do need to say we need to we 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 should not continue that course of treatment if it's not showing efficacy. Um, so those are the types of decisions that we make as well. In terms of um, pricing transparency, I would note, um, I think that's absolutely we need transparency, but I also think that it's not a silver bullet and it's not transparency alone that we need. Uh, in the sense of, let's say we do know what the prices are, well, you need to be able to take action on those prices and then determine um, is was that increase justified and how do you make that decision and who should do that work and should that be done at the state level and and then what should those prices what should those should there be caps as part of it so in addition to just doing transparency some states are toying with the idea of looking at kind of the ceiling prices for the for the maximum not uh, payment that Medicaid programs would make for certain drugs which would again be a challenge and different from what the federal regulations say, but an opportunity or, or an idea that has been explored. And then finally, you hear a lot about the concept of flexibility, um, especially, I, I just put this because it's, it's been a buzzword as of late, especially when we talk about um, are there changes afoot at the federal level with thinking about federal health care reform and what does uh, a, a block grant concept mean for the states and would states get flexibility. So as you can see from managing on the, the drug side in terms of the federal regulations, there are pretty stringent laws that the program has to follow. I guess I would say while there are certain elements of flexibility in general that's, it, that sounds appealing, I also think we need to exercise that with caution in the sense that as you can tell from how we've used the drug rebate program at a national level, we've been able to make sure that 60% of our costs are paid for. And so those are the types of things where we need to be careful. We don't want um, the drug rebate program going away because I, I guarantee that the state alone is not going to be able to get as good of a deal as a federal level when you have federal national purchasing power as well. So, so, so there's some of those types of considerations that we just have to keep in mind when we think about these discussions about flexibility and what is it that we actually need um, and then what are the perhaps unintended consequences in certain areas that what don't we want to make sure we lose um, or what do we risk in terms of what are we doing well. And so that's, um, that's where we are. And then I know I will turn it over to my colleague from there. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, our final speaker is Eileen Mallow, Deputy Director of the Office of Strategic Health Policy at the Wisconsin Department of Employee Trust Funds. Ms. Mallow has served a long career in state government, including as Policy Analyst for the Medicaid Program, Director of the Health, Risk, Health Insurance Risk Sharing Plan, and positions at the Office of the Commissioner of Insurance. She has also worked at a Madison area HMO before returning to state service at the Department of Employee Trust Funds in 2015. Ms. Mallow is a member of the National Academy of State Health Policy Pharmacy Cost Work Group and contributed to that group's October 2016 report titled States and the Rising Cost of Pharmaceuticals, a Call to Action. She also told me she is now qualified to be a travel agent between here and <laughs> Washington, D.C. Yeah, uh, I, can, I can tell you when the direct flights are and when you get home, um, which is useful to know. So thank you very much, Representative Kulsti, and who would have thought you could get this many people in a room to pay attention to drug pricing? Um, it shows you how important it is. I think we saw some really scary trend lines here, which is why the National Academy pulled together this group last year to start looking at prescription drug prices. We aren't the only ones, which, there we go. So um, the committee was convened about this time last year, and the charge to the committee there's the four items. They want greater transparency and capping of prices. So this is things we were all asked to look at. Attacking unfair trade practices. I think we've heard some. The committee, I think, heard some other things that we considered at least we had some discussion about as maybe some other areas that we could take some advantage of or try to find some strategies to deal with. Um, to look at expanding purchasing strategies that states could use. Rachel mentioned a few of them, and certainly that was part of what we looked at, which is combining all of the state purchasing power 
for both state and local employees, university or edu educational systems, the corrections department, and the Department of Health Services or the Medicaid program in each state. Um, when you think about that, that's a pretty big pool. The state of Wisconsin itself buys at, for the employees, state employees and local employees that participate in our program, our pool is 250,000 people. So that's a pretty big purchasing pool. If you start to add the Medicaid population and the corrections population, you can see why that becomes attractive. Although Rachel did talk about some of the issues that go along with that. And um, we also looked at, we were charged with looking at state taxation of pharmaceutical companies. This one didn't go very far. I'll talk about it a little bit more um, when I get to the recommendations that we have. But we had a series of meetings through 2016. We had some expert advice um, from people who knew a lot about how drugs were priced. Um, it, the, the issue that keep, keeps coming up in all of these is Sovaldi or um, some of the other hepatitis C drugs. And I would tell you that the information that was presented to us was that it was basically what the market would bear, and that's how they priced it. Mm -hmm. um, the cost of a liver transplant, by the way, is roughly $100,000, and that's before all the maintenance drugs that are needed, which I think helps you figure out how they set the price they did for that drug. Um, and in our program, anyway, the price of that drug is now about half of what it was when we have to buy it for our members. So we had a meeting in September, face-to-face, -face, the group. It's a very interesting group. There are 17 members. They come from a whole variety of backgrounds, governor's offices. We have two legislators on the committee on um, both sides of the aisle. We have people like me who represent large employer purchasing pools. We had a person from a corrections department. We had an attorney general representative on there. So it's very broadly um, dispersed group. Um, the meeting we had in September was pretty amazing. When you bring all that ideas into the room, you end up with some really interesting recommendations. So the committee issued their initial report in October of 2016 at the National Academy. They have a meeting every year. In the fall, they um, issued that report at that meeting. They had a meeting with Pharma the next week. Um, <laughs> there wasn't a lot that came out of it, but they did have a meeting with Pharma, and um, it was, it, it, they continue to talk to Pharma, the group does, about this. So here's why um, this group was called or convened. States and the Rising Cost of Pharmaceuticals is the report. It's actually not a very difficult read. It's about 25 pages. It's not even really small type. Um, so it is worth, <laughs> it's worth reading. <laughs> I would recommend that you take the time to do it, not just because I helped write it, but it's, it's, I think, really easily digestible. It has some good suggestions for states. Certainly no expectation that all states would do it and recognition that there needs to be some work to flesh out the ideas that came out of this report. But um, I think one of the, you can see here why everybody's concerned about this. Public employers. In 2013, we spent $31 billion as a nation on pharmaceuticals. Medicaid was $27 billion. I think that's largely because of the discounts that they can take advantage of that not all states can. And 2011, which is the last year they were able to pull numbers for state correctional departments, was $8 billion, but that is way before the hepatitis C drugs were introduced, and I would guess that that number is quite a bit bigger now because there is really a concentration in the correctional institutions about for people who need that treatment. So we had, um, a, there's 11 strategies that came out of this report. Um, so I'm gonna go through them all really quickly. And because there's a lot here, and I certainly don't want to so shortchange any of them, so if you have any questions about any of them, please feel free to ask me. Um, a big one that we talked about is increasing drug price transparency. There are, as we've heard, several different models of pharmacy benefits managers that have varying degrees of transparency that they provide to the purchasers. Everything from a model where you would pay as a, as a sponsor of a PBM a flat price per member per month administrative fee and then all the rebates, discounts, and any other pricing adjustments are returned directly to the, the plan to models where there is a spread and um, the whole issue between Anthem and ESI is basically about how much of the spread they get back. And you may or may not know exactly as a purchaser or a sponsor of a drug plan how much of that drug price, how much of the discounts and rebates accrue back to the plan and how much are retained by the PBM. So there is a recommendation and one of the first model acts that this, bill, that this committee started to work on was a way to improve drug price transparency. It also would have a, a system that if a drug price was going to increase significantly, there would be a reporting body within the state. Um, 
the committee discussed everything from focusing on high priced drugs to, as we've heard, there's really a, been a fairly steep increase in the price of generics over the past few years. So some way to justify increasing the increases that have been taken in generic prices. And um, also when a new drug is introduced, we see some, some, to me anyway, shocking price tags on some of the new drugs and some understanding the justification for those. Um, one of the other, the next option that they considered would be to create a public utility model to oversee drug prices. The argument to support that is that it serves a public good to have certain drugs available in um, reasonable ways that need to be overseen. Some of the drugs you see are things like the hepatitis C drug. There's a public health reason to have that controlled. Hepatitis, hepatitis C antivirals actually are a cure for the disease and it would stop the spread of a very expensive treat or a very expensive illness in the system. So there would be some really good reason to have that under control. And so there was, there was some discussion about, and there's a recommendation or a strategy presented in the, in the report that a public utility model might be a way that we could do some control over at least some really high cost drugs that serve a really high public good. We probably wouldn't deal with, for example, orphan drugs, but it would be something that really has a public health benefit that we could attribute to the certain drug and pull it back into this kind of a pricing model. Um, then there would be some recommendation or strategies on bulk purchasing of drugs that protect public health. Again, we would go to childhood vaccines are one of those places we would look at that. Some of the antiviral drugs, um, HIV drugs would be another one that would be in that category, but there is a broad public good from having those drugs readily available at a reasonable price um, a public health agency would be given the opportunity to bulk purchase and distribute them. The Suboxone is another one that, you know, we've seen that there's been some big increases in those drugs that if there's some bulk purchase, there might be a way to get a better price if a state or other governmental entity was bulk purchasing those drugs. They could better manage the price and make it more publicly available to protect public health. Um, the utilizing consumer protection laws, we've heard some discussion about advertising and how that may or may not be reflective of good consumer protection. Um, one of the recommendations or strategies, and we haven't done any work to flesh this one out yet, is to use some of the antitrust laws and to also look at how the advertising and whether or not it's effective and truthful and just to look at that a little bit more. I think that that's something the committee is going to take up in the future. Um, but they have not done any more than just present that as a strategy that would be available to any given state right now. Um, Reimportation of affordable drugs from Canada is one that we've spent a fair amount of time talking about. We've seen some discussion about how some drugs are much less expensive in Canada um, than they are in this country. And we're talking about 25%, 10% of what they are in another country. Um, right now, we're working on a transparency model act that would, or excuse me, um, a reimportation model act that would give some states some suggestions about how they could draft their own laws to make this workable. Um, Rachel talked a lot about how Medicaid is looking to um, work on greater purchasing flexibility and some of the issues that go around that. Medicaid has access to drug discounts that probably nobody else is. For example, Medicaid is required to be given the lowest available price on any given drug. That's not available to all purchasers, but certainly we wouldn't want to do anything to jeopardize our Medicaid program or anybody else's Medicaid program that might take away their purchasing flexibility and their ability to get the best possible price in the market. Um, we, had a, we, we had a good time when we had a meeting in September. These are all strategies that came out of that meeting. Um, the state itself could become its own pharmacy benefit manager. As I mentioned, there's a variety of strategies and different pharmacy benefit manager models. The state itself could set up its own PDM. It could combine then all the purchasing that's needed for a Medicaid program, a state employee or a local employee um, pharmacy, and also for the corrections departments. And those all are three very different, they buy different classes of drugs, obviously, based on their populations. But as a PBM, if you combine those populations, you could probably drive discounts. You would be confident then that you had received all of the benefit, all the discounts, rebates, everything else that the state was entitled to for the drugs that it purchased. And that might be one way to do it. There's obviously some cost in that. Um, this is not something that, you know, it, you need some very specialized clinical training in order to be able to manage these kinds of programs. The pharmacy benefits manager that the state of Wisconsin uses for its employees is 
all pharmacists. It's, they have very few people on staff that aren't pharmacists, so you will need to hire that, um, and that is a pretty specialized clinical background that's needed. Um, and it, it's something that certainly, I, you know, it's worth pursuing or thinking about. As Rachel mentioned, we talked about it when the hepatitis C drugs first came out as a bulk purchasing, but it's something that we can probably talk about a little bit more at some point. Um, return on investment pricing is, I think, the one that got pharma's attention the most. Um, mm -hmm. What this would look at is many of these drugs, as we talk about, when they come out, they have a really high initial, initial offering price. And within a couple of years, we've seen it in the hepatitis C drugs, the price has gone down significantly. So a state could pursue a strategy where they would look at the price that would be averaged over three to five years. Um, and instead of paying the initial $84,000, we would look at where we are now and we would pay an average price over the time it would, over the time that the drug is available. It would protect who the manufacturers are because they would be guaranteed an income stream on their drugs. Um, but it would also protect the state from a state from really huge price spikes on any individual drug when it becomes available. So that's something that we've talked about um, as a committee. I think we're probably going to do some more work on it. I think it needs a little bit more work, but it is out there as a strategy. And I, like I said, I think it is the one that's gotten the most interest from the pharmaceutical industry. Um, Egg whip which is a really <laughs> interesting acronym for um, the Medicare Part D employer group waiver plan. That would be something that would be available to any purchaser as uh, a way to access Medicare Part D drug discounts for their retirees, primarily employees. Wisconsin does have access to that, but it does, and it does save us some money. And the other one that we've been talking about is protecting consumers against misleading marketing. We've all seen the cons if you watch TV for half an hour, you get at least two drugs that are marketed to you. Um, we would look for some better strength or um, consumer protection laws to protect consumers against misleading advertising. Uh, we've all heard the story of the person who goes to the doctor and demands to see the drug, and it's for somebody who's another gender. And <laughs> it just, it, it, there just needs to be some better consumer protection in this market that we think about. And finally, we were talking about using shareholder activism to hold the pharmaceutical companies available. Um, we have, like most states, a fairly large amount of money that's invested in retirement funds or other funds for the state of Wisconsin. Um, we've had the discussion, I know, in the state from time to time about using that money, the, the assets of the state of Wisconsin in, a, in a, an investment policy to leverage um, some better behavior out of certain businesses or refusal even to invest in companies that aren't something that meets the values of the state of Wisconsin. So that would be another one where we would use our assets that we've invested in some other retirement funds, other assets to just hold the companies accountable for some of what we've seen as some of the more egregious pricing policies on some of these companies. And that's something that I think there's probably room for more discussion on. So what's happening now? Right now we have two model law drafts that we're working on. Um, reimportation is one, we have a meeting, we have a conference call next week, so we're going to talk about the reimportation model a little bit more. Um, they've actually released a, a model act on pricing transparency and how to better improve that. Um, the really nice thing that comes out of the National Academy is they don't just release a model act, they also give a lot of talking points, they give some good background material to help people understand what the options are for states in addressing these or working through these. So it's out there, and I'm certainly happy to help anybody find those if they need them. Um, like I said, reimportation is next week. And then um, the other thing is that FDA had requested guidance on healthcare economic information. It's basically the cost benefit analysis that's being done on some of the drugs that come out. And all states were asked to contribute. We did not, but um, states were asked to contribute comments on that regulation that they were working on. It was done earlier this year. I think the comments were due in early March on that one. The state of Wisconsin didn't, but I think some of the other states did. And then finally, in about two weeks, I am going out to Washington for another meeting where we're going to start drafting RFPs for state assistance and under better understanding or, or improving the way they purchase drugs. So that's, and that's about all I know about that meeting. But we are, we are starting to work on having being able to reallocate some money from NASHIP to help states improve their purchasing policies. So there's our advertising for ETF. Um, and <laughs> certainly I would ha be happy to entertain any questions with the rest, as along with the rest of the group. Mr. 
so I can't imagine that everybody in this room doesn't have a thousand questions. Um, but I get to ask the first one. So there you go. Um, when, so this has to do with Medicaid. So, and but we don't know what's going to happen on the federal level. Mm -hmm. Are, do you have any concerns that if we get block grants that that might diminish your flexibility with rebates and that you might be more beholden to certain drugs and pharmaceuticals? Yes. <laughs> uh, so to expand on that, again, um, what we have to be cognizant of is while we're doing a very good job we, of holding the cost, since you have this growth of new products coming out that are priced extremely high, and again, they're, they're targeted to disease states, and then also interestingly enough with like 21st Century Cures Act, they're coming out faster, mm -hmm. and there's some sense that perhaps um, uh, they're coming out faster with more indications that are approved, and so that puts Medicaid programs in a very tough spot. Because again, you're, what we would have to do is if, if those products come out, we need to pay them. And we need to pay them for individuals. And so that does mean that you will start seeing us needing to um, make those payments. And so that means, again, in a block grant environment that it, with a limited pool of dollar, that means that there are considerations elsewhere that you would have to see a shift. Again, that's where what, one question becomes is, well, what does that mean when you also have heard this federal discussion on the block grant world and, and has said, well, we'll give states flexibility. So again, that's, gonna, that's a bit ambiguous yet, and we'd have to take that into consideration. Thank you. Anyone, when, anyone else? Yes, Senator. Oh, thank you. Um, uh, two questions, if I may. <clears throat> One of them has to do is, um, has there been any sanctions against a, 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 a drug company uh, if they've been found guilty of predatory pricing of either uh, terminating their, their patent or um, requiring mandatory uh, licensing for uh, uh, um, generics so that generics can be made? And the second question has to do with, with senior care, but if I could just have you respond to that first question, please. I'll step on that landmine. Um, <laughs> yes, um, there have been lawsuits that are either presently under consideration or that have been settled um, alleging that the manufacturers have been engaging in practices that prevent the release of generic drugs. So there's something, um, I can't remember the exact term that's used these days, but um, brand name manufacturers paying generic manufacturers purposely to delay introduction of the generic drugs. Um, so there are other practices like that, but um, the, an the short answer is yes. So, so it is a sanction that's available. It's just saying, all right, your 17-year patent is, is done. Well, I would say my understanding is most of those are civil remedies and okay. not the kinds of remedies that you're talking about. It would be, for example, one drug company, one drug company suing another company because they don't have access to the same right. market that they might okay. otherwise get. But okay. Okay. And then another question is on senior care. Is I, my understanding is senior care is a unique part uh, Medicare Part D uh, program. It's unique to Wisconsin. And but and could you uh, sort of describe what are the benefits to uh, participants in the in the program, uh, and what are the effects on on the state uh, drug drug purchasing uh, because this is a, a Part D <coughs> program that's available. So the figures for senior care we did include, they're, they're, they're bundled into the uh, overall reports that we provided. In terms of what, how do we price, what we've been doing with the senior care program has been, have been following the Medicaid pricing structure is what we would pay for senior care as well. Okay. And so what we have seen in terms of, uh, I, I would say we continue to to run our senior care program, there still continues to be about uh, 90,000 people total, about 60,000, 30,000 split between where do we have the waiver authority to model like a state program like we do a, a comparable to a Part D program. Um, and we have continued to hold steady at offering those products. The one thing that we did with senior care this time around when we when we submitted our waiver proposal was that we added the coverage of Medicaid therapy management to the program. 
So that way we could ensure that seniors who are participating in that drug assistance program also had the opportunity to sit down with a pharmacist to do a comprehensive Medicaid reconciliation. So those are just some of the things that we just continue to hold steady and, and monitor and engage on the senior care program. Um, Representative Murphy. Thank you. Um, you know, earlier uh, in the presentation, um, we're talking about the, the cost of particular drugs around the world. And, you know, the United States really has the highest cost, and then it's, it's much lower in, in many other countries. I, I, I think most of these countries, the, the cost of drugs are capped in some way. Um, but what it seems to me is that uh, U.S. consumers are ending up paying 100% or, or close to that of all the research cost for drugs, uh, you know, and you can talk about whether I'm correct on that. But then the, the, the other side of the coin of the catch-22 to this is, is if we cap our drug prices, then no one will be paying for the research, and then do we start to, you know, slow, uh, slow the advent of, of, of new drugs? Yeah, so uh, I think that's a great comment, and that's that's been one of the biggest um, pushbacks from um, a lot of the industry as well as um, other groups, like consumer protection groups as well. Um, and, and really it's finding that balance between controlling the prices and protecting that innovation. Um, I think e even though, like I said, some of the numbers that I showed were, were estimates, um, you know, the, the industry has long been one of the, the most profitable in the country. Um, so, you know, potentially you could use the argument that maybe profits are too high. Um, you could also discuss, you know, things like uh, direct-to-consumer advertising and consumer protection, you know, is the amount that's being spent on um, marketing to patients or to providers to prescribe these drugs, are those appropriate? Uh, again, that's illegal in all other countries except for two in the world. Um, so it, it, potentially there's money where you could move that around and, and cut in other places than the research and development, but, but that is a very uh, important concern. Do you, just to follow up, if, if we were able to, through some method, drive these prices down here uh, domestically, do you, do you see that putting a price, uh, uh, price pressure in some of the other areas then? I mean, do you, you know, would, would, would drugs go up in Europe because they went down here? Possibly. Hmm. Uh, I think because of the different systems that are in place in the other countries where either the, the government sets the prices or caps the prices and things like that, um, there is, I suppose that could be a, a potential possibility, but there are limitations on how much, you know, if we decrease prices by 50% in the U.S., that doesn't mean prices are going to go up proportionally in other countries. Sure. I think there are, there are mechanisms in place to prevent that, um, but, you know, I don't know if anyone else has well, any other. Just one other way, I guess, of looking at this also is that, so uh, being uh, the elderly person that I am, I, I remember well the... Um, when, when oil prices were capped in the 70s and all of a sudden there were gasoline shortages in, in lines at the gas station. I mean, is, you know, I mean, could you get to the point? I mean, and this goes back to what, what I talked about, about new drugs being, you know, coming online or, you know, would you end up with shortages of something? Um, so this probably isn't going to help matters, but we're actually already experiencing some unprecedented shortages in a lot of drug areas already. Um, so I, I don't really know how the, the price caps might impact that, but um, that is one of also the contributors to rising prices, particularly for a lot of the generic drugs that have been available for a long time. Okay, so it's where the shortages are would be more or less in, in areas where the, where, the, where the price isn't real high to begin with. Is that, what you're, is that sort of what you're saying, or um, am I following your... It, there are a lot of different areas, a lot of different drugs, a lot of different treatments where there are shortages. Okay. Um, and some of those are where you're seeing these really rapid price increases. Okay. Um, but not all, you know, for example, the, the Daraprim uh, situation with Turing Pharmaceuticals, that, that wasn't due to a shortage. That was just uh, a price 
decision that was made by the company. Okay, thank you. I think we have a question from an audience participant back there. Thank you for everything. Uh, it looks like um, we're not going to probably count on pharma or insurance company uh, companies to uh, improve the, either the prices or the patient care and access to care. So what are your thoughts, the distinguished panel's thoughts, on the medical care system because we are up for renewal, replacement, whatever. It's going to come back, we think. Um, the issue is going to come back. What are the um, changes in um, federal medical care system that could help in this country with the prescription drug prices and with improvement of uh, patient care? I guess I would say part of what we've been working on comprehensively is, you, is the concept of health homes and how do you combine and make sure that you're managing both the medical and pharmacy side together. How do you make sure that you have case management and ensure that, uh, for example, when we worked on a health home initiative with AIDS, ARCW of Wisconsin for populations with AIDS HIV, part of our design was to ensure that you had a clinical pharmacist who was part of that care team. So again, just thinking about how do you engage um, pharmacists in that process in terms of working on the overall medical care component. I think we've seen that trend with different health homes and other ways that we've worked on care coordination strategies overall, and that's definitely a trend that we've seen. And I would say the committee that that I've been participating in is focused very much on what state solutions could be to this. One of the things that we early on took off of our um, list of possible strategies was a change in federal drug pricing because it's not something that we would have had any ability to influence other than to maybe use a bully pulpit. So we are focused very much on state activities, state options. Thank you. Uh, Doctor, look, you had something, uh, you had mentioned that there's only two countries that allow that advertising and or to, to the public and or the physicians. Who, uh, what is the other country besides the United States? New Zealand. New Zealand. And I believe Brazil allows some marketing on over-the-counter medications, but not for prescription medications. Okay. okay. And Very small list, so it's easy to remember. <laughs> now, you know, I, I'm 55 years old, and I don't remember all these commercials growing up. Was there a law change in there somewhere? I mean, I know there was a law change when lawyers could advertise, but I mean, was it, when was that law changed? I don't think I wrote down the year. Um, it was a Supreme Court decision on free speech, but I can't tell you when it was. Okay. Yeah. And then the other question I had would be for uh, Ms. Henry, that um, you had mentioned something about, uh, do we not have the ability to change to generic in the Medicaid program, or uh, you know, can you explain a little bit more on that? Uh, what I meant by that, is I think I had the statement generic only formulary. So, for example, some. Uh, PBMs might say we're moving to a 100% generic only formulary. Um, and again, just in terms of how we think about any drug that has a rebate agreement is therefore a drug that the Medicaid program needs to offer a path to coverage for. So we have preferred, our preferred drug list, we definitely on that preferred drug list many times are preferring generics over the more expensive brand names. That's part of what we're doing. What I think is interesting and sometimes what we hear is that uh, there are times when the Medicaid program will prefer a brand name drug over a generic. It's in a rare situation, but the reason why is if based on that federal rebate law, it's going to be more cost advantageous for a sustained period of time for the Medicaid program to do that, we will make that decision, Okay. which is why uh, we do that. Okay, good. Thank you. Apparently, 97 is the year that the um, decision was made to allow for direct-to-consumer advertising. Um, this question stems from a comment that Dr. Look made in his presentation, but it's open to whoever it applies to the most. Um, and this was in regards to the EpiPen and the um, lawsuit regarding the exclusion of other products in um, 
and the ability to give a rebate. So when we have these drug companies and these benefit managers that are non-government based and we have a capitalist society, how do you how do you determine that it is inappropriate for a drug company to make that type of negotiation with a pharmacy benefit manager and what are the steps that can be taken to stop that? So in, in this case, I think the, the broader way that they're trying to address this issue is through the court system, through antitrust laws, rather than sort of anything related to the pricing aspect of things, because there are statutes in place, I believe at the federal level, that prevent some of those activities from happening of you know, making deals to exclude other therapies. Um, I think one of the advantages of having Medicaid present here today is the fact that you can see the differences between some of the numbers I discussed that really don't account for those rebates versus um, Medicaid being aware of what they are actually paying for some of these drugs. And on the private side, those numbers are very uh, confidential. They're protected by disclosure agreements and things like that, non-disclosure agreements. So we don't really have as good of a sense for what's going on on the private side. And, uh, you know, we sort of rely on normal market forces to resolve some of these issues. But we know because of the unique context in which healthcare and prescription drugs take place um, that those market forces maybe aren't as effective as, as they are in other industries. Thank you. Uh, one category of spending that hasn't been called out yet is the, um, the lobbying efforts on the part of the pharmaceutical industry. Uh, Kevin, can you kind of uh, focus a little more attention on that category of expenditure, how that contributes to our situation, how that differs from other countries, et cetera? Um, so in the distribution of, of spending figure that I had, there was quite a large piece of pie that included other. And um, manufacturers have a very vested concern in making sure that their voices are heard on things related to pricing and coverage and things like that at state and federal levels. So there is a large amount of money being spent. I don't have any uh, exact numbers in front of me, but um, it is a very important um, component of, again, this is something sort of unique to our healthcare system. Uh, some of the things around the, the Marathon Pharmaceuticals case is that there are even disagreements within the lobbying organizations of some of these pricing practices. And as a result, Marathon has withdrawn from pharma as well as uh, some other companies are starting to withdraw from that um, because there are questions about is this really an effective use of our money or we're spending so much on this is the return that we're getting appropriate. Um, so it is a very important component and a lot, uh, I would say most if not all, of the major pharmaceutical manufacturers are members and are engaged in contributing to pharmaceutical lobbying efforts. Uh, and um, that is a very um, big part of what goes on, uh, particularly at the federal level as well. But that is also separate from things like marketing and advertising costs and lawsuits and things like that. Anyone else? Then I have one more. Oh, you have one? Okay, never mind. So my question for the panelists is around some of the prior authorization and medical policy work that um, you all have done, and uh, particularly in the area of hepatitis C. Um, so I know that uh, around the country, um, in different states, there's been um, some litigation that has forced some of the state Medicaid um, programs along with uh, payers in those states to actually change their coverage policies for those hepatitis C drugs. And so I'm wondering if there's been any discussion in the state of Wisconsin around that. Um, you know, I do believe that uh, our Medicaid program has some pretty strict criteria um, for the hepatitis C administration and for qualifying. And I'm just wondering because I think other payers in the state have kind of followed your lead, but um, there's concern mounting that there may be a shift in policy uh, relative to legal pressures from some of the actions taken in other states. It's been a, a very important dialogue, and that's something that 
um, we've been challenged with to understand what do you do when you have an extremely high cost drug and you, you know that there's an extreme value to a consumer to provide this product. I, I guess I would say um, I do want to just be cognizant that we do have on, uh, coming up in the next two weeks our prior authorization committee which reviews our preferred drug list is meeting and the discussion of our hepatitis C coverage criteria will be discussed at that May 10th meeting and so at this time I'd like to defer that discussion until the formal committee has, had a, has made a determination on our approach moving forward and we do have recommendations that we'll be providing there but again for um, sake of making sure that we're obtaining our expert consults from committee members, um, we will defer comment. Thanks for all those questions. And we found an effective way to end the, the, these briefings is to ask for um, a closing statement of a sort from our panelists to um, what specific considerations or concepts you would recommend policymakers or audience members take away from this briefing with them today. So we'll start with Eileen and move our way back to the panel. Okay. I was worried you were going to start with me first. Um, <laughs> so uh, the um, National Academy of State Health Policy is offered 11 different options for states. I think there's no expectation that every state will implement all 11, but they are out there for your consideration. Um, certainly if there's something that anybody wants the Academy to look at more in depth, we would be, you know, I would be willing to carry that message back to the overall committee. We continue to work. As I said, we've drafted two model acts for consideration, and I expect that we will do some more. Um, so I, I just, I think there's options that states should use, and not expect that any single one of them is the silver bullet to fix it, but there are other states looking at maybe some different ways to work on it and things that we can learn from them. So I the takeaway that I hope you heard from the Medicaid perspective is that um, overall we think we're doing all right with the strategies that we have been implementing in terms of holding down cost. As we move into the future of increased specialty drug pricing and we know that the pipeline for some of these specialty products, especially targeting disease states for kids who are going to be primarily on Medicaid programs and not on commercial insurance, we need to think about what we do. And that's where I think some of the tools that Eileen suggested that are in that report, are probably some of them are more targeted towards those cases than others. That's where our priority is. Um, we would also just ask that um, we're happy to share information. We think that um, we, we, we understand the differences and strategies that we can use. And I think sometimes based on what the problem is for the program, there are certain strategies that are going to work better than others. And so figuring out how we have a uh, engaged discussion and making sure that we have the different perspectives represented when we think about future policy considerations would be important. And then I'll just add, I think the, the core question that we have to answer somewhat as a society is um, what should the pricing of drugs be based off of? So in a lot of other manufacturing industries, which pharmacy kind of falls within that, um, there's definitely research and development that goes on. There's all the same considerations that you have to, for innovation and, and releasing new products. However, in those industries, the consumer is usually the direct respondent to those costs, and so the price point is dependent on that consumer. Um, what we see in the pharmaceutical industry is there's multiple layers. Um, so the benefits that you see with a, a manufactured drug product aren't necessarily aligned with who's paying for that. And so there's some diffusion of what this price is and where the benefits are. And with the hepatitis C examples, I mean, we're talking about pricing a drug based on value, not pricing a drug based on how much it costs to manufacture that product. So um, in other areas of um, consumerism, we're, we're paying for something based on the, the cost that it is for manufacturing, what that price point is for a consumer. So I do think it's a, it's, that's the core question that we have to answer because if you follow the money, um, the system is inflated, um, and that's why there's all this money in the manufacturers and larger PBMs and commercial payers. So I think that that's the core question we have to answer, and like Eileen mentioned, there's a lot of levers that we can pull to do that, um, but that's, that's what we're looking at. I think one of the themes that's come through all of the presentations today, as well as many of the questions that, and concerns that were brought up, is that this is a situation where there are a lot of moving pieces, and there are a lot of different organizations involved, a lot of different considerations 
there's no one big main bad guy. Uh, if you ask a manufacturer who the bad guy is, they'll tell you it's an insurer. If you ask an insurer, they'll tell you it's a manufacturer. Um, but there are a lot of different organizations involved in getting drugs from production to a patient's hands. And we have a very complex, unique system with sort of our third-party payment system where we have, uh, you know, unlike other industries, it's not the consumers who are paying the final price. A lot of times they're paying only a small portion of it and an insurance company or some other payer is involved. So this is a very difficult issue to address practically. And no matter what solution you pick, there are going to be other consequences as a result of those choices. It's not that suddenly drug prices are fixed or prices for one drug are fixed. Fixing one issue, uh, you know, squeezing on one end is going to have impacts somewhere else. So this is something that needs to be very carefully considered. And we, we have a lot of different policy options available to us, and we need to assess the benefits and, and costs of those. And we need to be very careful in how we address this issue. But it is something that, um, is, is very important to a lot of uh, our, our citizens here in the state as well as around the country. Um, I can only say that I am very excited to be up here and be with this collective brain power that is um, associated with the state of Wisconsin. So thank you very much for being here as presenters. And with that, we'll, uh, We'll bring today's briefing to a close. If you haven't done so already, please fill out your evaluation forms um, and leave them either with staff at the doors or on the tables on your way out. Um, all presenter slides and other materials in addition to the video of today's program will be posted on our website at www.evidencebasedhealthpolicy.org. At least some of those slides are already posted. Uh, on our website, you'll also find information on our past briefings and upcoming programs. Thanks to Representative Colsey for moderating, all four of our panelists, and to all of you in the audience today for attending. Have a great day, and thanks very much.